Is this thing on? Are you ready, Matt? You're listening to Box Office Binges with Matt Diaz and Ernesto Santos. Good evening, folks. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Box Office Binges. And we are back for another episode of Box Office Bingers. Matt, this is a very special episode. I mean, I feel like we just found out who's going to the Super Bowl. That's pretty much that's that's like <laughs> in the in, that's the movie nerd equivalent of what we're going to be talking about today. Because not only did the Oscar knobs come out, Matt, what movie are we reviewing this week? Now we, I guess now we can say officially the Oscar Oscar nominated film American Fiction, uh, starring Jeffrey Wright, Tracy Ellis Ross, Sterling K. Brown, Issa Rae, written and directed by Cord Jefferson, uh, who made his directorial directorial debut. Uh, he was a story editor for episodes of Master of None, The Good Place, and Watchmen. Which, just given those credits, kind of is interesting to see that he has written for comedies as well as um, as a drama that is Watchmen. And I think comedy and drama is a good mix uh, for his directorial directorial debut for American fiction. So I'm really interested to hear your thoughts about this movie uh, now that we know officially that it's in uh, a best picture uh, as well as multiple Oscar nominated film. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk to talk to you about this movie. Uh, but more importantly, as you already suggested, Ernesto, this is the moment we've been waiting for, for. a long time. This is we've been at least a, a year. Long, we've been <laughs> prepping our uh, at least at least a, at least a year. We've been we've been prepping easily. I think the earliest nomination is Barbie Barbenheimer. I'm I'm pretty sh- yeah yeah that was yep yeah Barbenheimer. We basically have been talking about the Oscars since then. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we already knew. If and if. Yeah, exactly. We already knew some of these, um, but we've been slowly building up to it. We've been talking about certain movies and saying, hey, maybe this one might be nominated or we're going to watch this one because it's being talked about a lot. And then now the moment's finally here to talk about the nominations for the 96th Academy Awards. And all of its surprises, big nominations, snubs, all of it, it's here. We're going to go over some of the big nominations here, and then we're going to be diving in. So with that, we're going to be transitioning into our entertainment news, which is going to be heavily on the award season. We're also going to be the Emmy winners a little bit later, um, as well as what we've been watching. And of course, at the end, our spoiler review on American fiction. So with that, let's get into the 96 Academy Award nominees. Let's start with Best Picture. For Best Picture, we have American Fiction, Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Four Things, and The Zone of Interest. So I think I'm very happy to say, Ernesto, that we have already covered eight out of the 10 movies in previous episodes, we're going to be talking about American fiction in this one. And to no, no surprise to anybody, we're going to be discussing the zone of interest on next week's episode since the movie is now coming out this Friday finally. in the U.S. So finally. So what do you think about these nominations and any big surprises here? Um, I think I don't think there's really any. Sur- I mean, for me, the only surprise is the zone of interest. I mean, because and this is me, Mm. obviously, post um, seeing American fiction. I think all these movies have their merit to be up here. Um, Mm -hmm. I think once I see the zone of interest, then I'll have a a better uh, I'll have a better idea of what of what I think are going to win when we talk about our predictions. But I think for me, you know, we're going to talk about some snubs. But you know, my favorite picture from last year. I mean, the massive disrespect for Iron Claw 
like being absent <laughs> just completely at the Oscars in general is a travesty. Mm-hmm. I mean, that to me that's the big to me that's the biggest one. Yeah, and and we did talk about it a few weeks ago when we saw the Iron Claw that it would be like one of the biggest snubs if it gets zero nominations. And we'll talk about a little bit more as we go through some of these nominations. But yeah, the Iron Claw did not win, did not get nominated for anything. And I don't know. I feel like that. I I feel like it should have got something, like yeah. at least one, maybe not Best Picture, even though I think it should be up there. But then when you talk about which movie you take out. In in favor of best picture, like if you take if you take a movie out, I have one in mind, Ernesto. So do I. That I would take. You want to say three, two, one, and we'll say it I together. I bet it's the same movie. <laughs> okay, all right, ready. Three. So I'm gonna say three, two, one, and after one, we say the movie. Okay. You ready? Okay, three, two, one, Maestro. Oh, I was gonna say Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get dive into deeper into that a little bit so, later. Newsflash: I was wrong. <laughs> I don't know you, Matthew. I was wrong. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> like, oh, they know each other. Mm, clearly not. <laughs> no, not even close. Not even close. Um, not even close. Um, but I mean, to your point, I don't think this is any a surprise. We talked about it last week when we went over uh, the Producers Guild Awards. Actually, their Best Picture nominees were these exact 10 films right here. Um, what was believed to be snubbed, however, was the Iron Claw, uh, Saltburn, and The Color Purple. I think there are a lot of people advocating for some of these films in certain ways. And uh, at the very least, maybe getting a Best Picture nom and to no prevail, none of those. Uh, Saltburn, another one we'll be talking about later, uh, also received zero nominations. Well, that's uh, fine. But yeah, did not get it. <laughs> that's fine. So, you said that's, that's fine. fine. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I agree with you. With that yeah, yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, Newsflash, again, we talked about it last week and Ernesto a few weeks back. Did not uh, did not like that movie. No. It's, it's uh, there for shock. So it was there for shock value. Yeah, it you know it tells lessons of the culture but it just does it in a in a in a way that's just so unnecessary <laughs> i i agree with you there um what's an interesting fact though is that three of the best picture nominees were directed by a woman uh the most recognized in history of the academy awards so uh, those three movies being anatomy of a fall barbie and past lives uh, i think this is the first time that uh well, not the first time that a woman have was it was. I think this is the most it was recognized within what, the best a, picture category at a, at a single time. At a single time for the best picture nom that three women have directed it. I, I don't think it's ever surpassed. Maybe even one, maybe two, but now it's three. So at least slowly, anyway, I should say that you know we're getting more inclusion into the Oscar noms. But you ask somebody else and they're saying they're moving too slow, which I can agree in some fashion there. Yeah. Um, um, but yes, anyway, so that's that's an interesting fact there. Uh, moving on to best director, we have uh, Justine Trent, Trait? Trier. I think Trier. Justine Trier. Thank you. Uh, f- uh, like I said before, she uh, directed Anatomy of the Fall. We have Martin Corsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. This is his first, not his first Oscar nom, but his first Oscar nom as a director. Mm. He received them for Best Picture picture for producing best pictures um as well as writing but never as a director it's kind of kind of shocking when you hear that yeah but but this is the first time he finally got and it and it's not uncommon because look at um look at uh greta gerwig she got nominated for best picture Mm -hmm. but she's not nominated for best directing so right and we'll get to that in a second um the rounding out the nominees we have uh yorgos lamano lanthimos There you go. Uh, for Poor Things and then Jonathan Glazier for The Zone of Interest. I think there were a lot of big surprises for Jonathan Glazier and Justine Trier um, <clears throat> for their directing noms. Um, I think I don't I guess it seems the Oscars are favoring a lot of the international films, which is great. But where is getting more of the headlines this week is at the detriment of Greta Gerwig not getting the best director nom. For, for directing Barbie, though she got uh, nominated for the Directors Guild of America Award, mm. so I think a lot of people associated that with that's a that's a lock. She's she's got the nom. Same goes for Alexander Payne, who directed the Holdovers. He also got 
the Directors Guild of America nom as well, and they both got snubbed for the Oscar nomination. Yeah, that's, I mean, not to not credit Gerwig, but I think more so the whole, I think the holdovers not at least being nominated for directing. I mean, I think that's an incredible film. I mean, that was just such a sleeper yeah. that, like, literally a movie that you and I have publicly said, I was like, I don't even know if yeah. I want to watch this movie. And then I walked away mm -hmm. absolutely loving it and just how it was constructed. I mean, there's just a, there's just mm -hmm. a lot, and we talked about it in our review, but there's just a lot to appreciate in that film. And not and, there, and there's yeah, a lot absolutely. to appreciate in Barbie as well. I mean, I'm just saying. I guess, you know, there can it, only be room for five. That, like, and me, you and I have kind of talked before, like, 2023 was just a heavy hitter for really good movies. Mm -hmm. It was a good problem to have, but then when it comes down to, th to things like this, and it's, you know, somebody gets left out. Right. And it, it's hard to, you know, to see, like, okay, which one would you take out, right? And I think without seeing the zone of interest, I can't really talk about that film, at least in its directing style. So that's out of the conversation for now. But then we go to the other four, like anatomy to fall. was a great film. And the way that it was directed is something up there that that's worth the nomination. Absolutely. We have, um, um, obviously Christopher Nolan was being hailed for his, um, for his directing style for Oppenheimer. And then we also have, um, Yurgos Lan Lan Lanthimos for poor things, which I also understand. So it really just comes down for me, it comes down to Martin Corsese, and, yeah. which has been nominated countless times already. And I would say, and as much as it, my problems with the film, I think the way it was directed, the, it is well warranted for the nomination. I mean, it's this. It is tough. Like those are, and this is all I'm saying is that Zona Interest better be a banger of a movie. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm gonna double check to see if she has received. A directing nom before because i know she's been a favorite at the oscars before oh. um i know she has yes uh greta gerwig she in 27 or for the 2018 oscars she was nominated for best director um for ladybird so she has received the nomination before but i think a lot of people were looking at barbie as her next time getting it and again to fairness to everybody else like she she did get the she got the Golden Globe nom she got the Critics Choice nom she got the Director's nom it's like it's all there, but just not winning the Oscars. To your point, I will really am very interested to see the zone of interest. But from the five we have, it's a tough race. From what we have it's up just here already, tough... <laughs> not even including yes, Barbie. <laughs> it's it's just a tough race. Not even including Barbie. Yes, um, I think it's uh, Celine. Uh, song, yeah, song from past lives. Um, we didn't even talk about yeah, that. She, I mean, that's another great movie. <laughs> yes, another great movie that a lot of people said that she also got snubbed uh, for best director. But I mean, it, depending on how you want to look at it, right? Yeah, I know it's under, it's either like the specifics of it, but all those three, uh, every one of these directors also received an Oscar nomination because they were for best picture. Mm -hmm. So, like, you, they gave it to them for best picture, but now when we get down to the nitty-gritty of it, you didn't get the specifics. And I think that is equally as important than, uh, you know, than getting just the best picture nomination. So there's that. I get it. It's just, as we said before, it's a tough race. Another one that's interesting, moving on to best actress, we have Annette Benning in Nyad, which was a surprise. We have Lee Gladstone uh, for Killers of the Flower Moon, which with her nomination becomes the first Native American to be nominated for Best Lead Actress. So that's already an incredible feat there. Uh, Sandra Huller for Anatomy of the Fall, which is also, in my opinion, quite surprising, even though she's been nominated in other award shows, but now she's got the official Oscar nom. Uh, we have Carrie Mulligan for Maestro, and we have Emma Stone for Poor Things, who Emma Stone has been killing it in the other award shows, as we talked about in previous ones. So, like... That one, a big surprise there for Annette Benning and Nyad. I did not see that coming at all. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, not obviously the big noticeable snub here from everybody talking is Margot Robbie. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, once again, I mean, that movie Nyad... And that betting better be the shining star. That's all I'm saying. Like, <laughs> like she better be the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> but even, but even yeah, you, it, you, it, you also noted here too some of the snubs. You know, Natalie Portman in uh, May December, and also Greta Lee in Past Lives. Um, all mm -hmm. 
as weird as May December was, Natalie Portman gave an absolute phenomenal performance in that film. And same thing for Greta Lee. Yeah. She was fantastic in past lives. Like her perform yeah. her and the other lead actor whose name escapes me, both of their performances really sold that film. Yeah, and and like especially for like like Natalie Portman, she got like maybe Greta Lee, she wasn't really nominated in the other award show, so there's nothing leading into True. maybe getting it. Annette Betting she did get the um, Golden Globe nom, I'm pretty sure, for, like, comedy or drama in there. And then she, I believe she also got the Critics' Choice. So, like, her nom was there, so it was not as a surprise to get it. But I don't think anyone was expecting for Margot Robbie not to get it. Because especially that she got the SAG. Mm. So she got the Screen Actors Guild nom. And so then you translate that to the Oscars as almost a shoe in So... A lot of people, a lot of the internet was really upset when Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie did not get the noms um, for their respective, for director and best actress. But as we discussed in previous episodes, that as we as we look at Barbie as a whole and what it represents, best picture is there. And then when you think about Barbie, yes, Margot Robbie and her performance was leading through, but you remember some of the other aspects a little bit more than solely her performance. Correct. And and maybe that maybe that was one of the reasons why she didn't get in there. Like there was also the music that stands out a little bit more. Even uh, America Ferrera that we're going to talk about later. Ryan Gosling was a standout in there too. So like I'm not saying she didn't deserve the nom. Again, we're just talking about it's a hard race, and so it all depends on what you believe. Um, to like what stands out more to the voters, and I guess she didn't get enough votes to get in. So it's a tough race there. For sure. Absolutely. Um, moving on to best actor, we have Bradley Cooper in Maestro, Coleman Domingo in Rustin, Paul Giamonti in The Holdovers, Cillian Murphy in Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction. Uh, these five actors have been pretty much dominating in every award show. And so really not much of a surprise here that any one of these um, is, is up for uh, that nomination. Yeah, absolutely. And then... And I'm going to talk about it in my what you're watching, but I've actually seen I actually watched uh, Rustin this this past mm. this past week. And I'll tell you, all five of these names, they all belong up here. Every single one of them. Well, yeah. So I think r- really the only snub here was Leonardo DiCaprio and Killers of the Flower Moon, who also received the Golden Globe nom and the Critics Choice nom. Uh, and so but I think I'm OK with that. Yeah, yeah it was fine. Yeah, I'm I, fine with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I give given the rest, and like I haven't seen Rustin yet, but seeing the other four is like, yeah, I can. It's okay. Like I also liked all of their other performances as much, and like I've seen Near Dollar DiCaprio. He's also been here many times before. Maybe give some other people a chance. That's all I'm Absolutely. saying. Absolutely, like Coleman Domingo, and it's not even about like give, not even like giving him a chance. Is that? That performance is warranted to be up there. It's like all of those performances mm. are warranted to be up there. Not to say that Leo's is it, but once again, 2023 was a banger of a year for movies. So it's kind of hard. It yes. was really hard. You know, it's going to be hard to narrow them down. Yeah. And moving on from that, we have Best Supporting Actress, which is Emily Blunt in Oppenheimer, Danielle Brooks in The Color Purple, um, which... I, I, I almost wrote that it was a surprise, but it was the writing was on the wall. She got the Golden Globe. She got the critics. She was she's been there. So not too much of a surprise to see uh, Danielle Brooks there, which was this one in particular is a huge surprise. America Friera Fri, Fri, America Friera in Barbie Ferreira. Ferreira. Thank you. In Barbie. Nobody saw this coming. And See, then it's. I did. I felt like this you, was well okay. warranted. I felt like this was well warranted. I don't know if I. I don't know if I brought it up or not. But I felt like out of the movie, like her her performance was well well warranted. Like she was a shining star in that film. She has. I mean, we talked about her in our review, and I mean, she has that monologue that's like you know very well known, very mm-hmm. well known part of the film. But look, look at everybody's takeaways from the film. Like yes, Margot Robbie has. There are key moments that she has, but some of the main takeaways is america ferrera's like response to barbie like being the way that she was was the whole point of the film like 
Barbie was changing because of how America Ferrera was feeling. So you almost, to me, it almost shifted where America Ferrera is like is like the main character and Barbie is a supporting character. Like yeah, yeah you're and, and following Barbie, but it's really about America Ferrera. That's that's an interesting way of looking at it, and it's funny because when I saw this nomination, I was actually really I I was shocked. But in like, in, I was, it was twofold. Like, oh my God, she got the nom. There's no, like no, nothing leading up to this said that she was getting a nomination. But then when you think about it at the same time, it's like, it makes complete sense. Why? And, and obviously to the voters, a lot of people probably resonated with the speech that she gave and that tied to the story that was Barbie. So yeah. it well-deserved nomination there for sure. Not saying that it's not, it's just, to me, it was like nothing, no sign said that it was going to happen. And she defied those odds. Um, rounding out the best supporting actress nomination goes to Jodie Foster for Nyad, which was also a surprise and uh, divine joy Randolph and the holdovers who's been dominating in every award show. So she's the one to beat right now because yeah. she's been winning. Um, but Again, Nyad coming out of nowhere, getting two acting noms. What about that movie that we don't know about that we now need to see to, to see it. what the Oscars <laughs> I guess I'm going to have yeah, to watch exactly. it. Yeah, <laughs> um, What was snubbed was Julianne Moore for May, December, who also received the Golden Globe and the Critics' Choice nom. And uh, Rosamund Pike for Saltburn. She also received the Golden Globe nom. Sure. Um, <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, <laughs> like, I, I, I like, I like this list a little. But bit I like, Ro- I like Rosemary Pike. Stubs. Just, I mean, that movie is, it's fine. But I, I do feel yeah. that it was a stub for Julianne Moore because once again, her and Natalie mm-hmm. Portman, as weird as that movie is, like as kind of weird directions it goes in, I think they were the thing. They were the things that were keeping me interested the entire way through. Yeah, and the fact not not, not to knock anyone else's performance, but the fact that these two were the snubs. Clearly, like this wasn't as a, the tide of a race as the other ones. <laughs> that, that's all. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. It's it's like I did not like Saltburn. <laughs> we know. <laughs> and also, May December was weird, but I I think Natalie Portman was more of a standout than Julianne Moore was. Um, I agree. I can agree so with that. Even though, yeah. Um, moving on to Best Supporting Actor, we have Sterling K. Brown in American Fiction. We have Robert De Niro in Killers of the Flower Moon. We have what I've been calling since I saw the movie Robert Downey Jr. in Oppenheimer. We have Ryan Gosling in Barbie, and we have Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things. Man, is this a tough category? Yeah, and even even some of the even some of the snubs. Like, I mean. Mm-hmm. Some of the snubs you have William Defoe from Poor Things, Charles Melton in May December, and Dominic. And I agree with you, Dominic Sessa in The Holdovers. That's the one I think to me that hurts the most. I would have loved to. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to have seen his name up there. I think it would have been well warranted. I would honestly say. Well, I don't want to say that. I don't know. I I kind of want to say over it, Robert De Niro, but. It's like it, Robert De Niro gave a very strong performance, but I think Dominic Sessa. Look, I mean, coming this is like his first movie coming out of the gate, like first movie in, he gives yeah. he gives this stronger performance. It, it's okay, I'll say it. I think Dominic Sessa should have replaced Robert Down. Uh, no, sorry, Robert De Niro, not yeah, Robert Downey no, Jr. Yeah, he deserves you, you it. You shut your mouth. Uh, Robert De Niro. <laughs> Put some respect on no, his let name. Me, let me let me start, start over because now we're getting confused. All right, let me start over. <laughs> Dominic Dominic. <laughs> Dominic let me start that Sessa. over <laughs> let me start that over yes Dominic Sessa should have gotten the nom over Robert De Niro that's what I'm saying um, mm. I think Leonardo DiCaprio gave a much better performance than Robert De Niro in my opinion and so like if there was anyone to be snubbed I understand maybe Leo and Robert De Niro his performance was fine but it was just more like of this hard ass like gangster type like I've seen that before like, but what Dominic Sessa did for holdovers was like it it felt real. Yeah. Just the way that he connected with Paul Giamatti. Mm-hmm. Um But yeah. But another fun fact when it comes to the acting categories, every acting category at the twenty twenty four Oscars has at least one person of color nominee, which I guess has never been the case before uh coleman domingo and jody foster made oscar history as it's the first time two openly lgbtq actors have been nominated for playing 
LGBTQ characters. Okay. Uh, so that's cool. There's a fun fact there as well. I, I mean, I, th- I think it's pretty cool too. Um, moving on to best original screenplay, we have Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Maestro, May December, and Past Lives. So even though May December has been passed over for every acting category, at least it was recognized for the original screenplay. Mm, true. Very true. Uh, and I, the only one that I wrote down here that was snubbed was Air. I know a lot of people was praising the script. It did come out back in like March, and it did. I, I don't think it received any other acting or any writing nom uh, before then. Maybe maybe one award show might have given it, but like it was like a really early contender for best screenplay. I can agree with that. Obviously, I can agree with that. It was a yeah. really. I mean, it was a great film. I mean, it was a fantastic story. It really was. But, but then you also look at what it was up against in these five movies. You can you can see you can see the you can see where you know it kind of fell short for air. And these are these are all strong uh, nominations for best original screenplay. True. I mean, May December was weird, but it was in, the, the story was so intriguing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent. But it was a little weird. I I like. For me, I was like, I like a little fun in this nomination, and I guess the holdovers was it. So yeah, but it's such a but the holdovers is more than a, a comedy. It's just such a beautiful story. Like it's just such a it perfect and, and it, the way it fits in as a as a Christmas movie as well. Like it, like mm-hmm. I could easily go back and rewatch the holdovers. I will. Yeah, absolutely. Not to knock it, but I don't think I will ever watch May December ever again. <laughs> And I will put my hat in, in, in there as well and say the same for Maestro. I agree. Yeah, well. I agree. I agree. Because it, it's, yeah. I mean, Maestro was an Oscar Beatty movie. I mean, that's what it was. A Maestro was very much an Oscar Beatty movie. And I'll talk about Maestro a little bit um, after we go through these nominations. Oh. Um, best Adapted Screenplay. Uh, those nominations are going to American Fiction, a Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. Another tough category. Absolutely. With uh, without seeing the zone of interest, the other four, um, very strong. I do have my opinion, however, that we'll save for our predictions episode. Um, but all of these movies, um, the zone of interest withstanding, all deserves to be up there. No, no problems with that. Nope, not at all. Um, and then rounding out the, the the list of nominations we're going to be going over, best animated feature goes to The Boy and the Heron, Elemental. Nimona, Robot Dreams, the movie no one's heard of, <laughs> and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This right here, with aside from Robot Dreams, because I don't know what that movie is, but hopefully it will come to the U.S. soon so we can watch it to see why it got the nom. But the rest of the four, 100% deserves to be up yeah, there. I need to, without it, I need to see yeah. Nimona. Nimona is the one, the, and the Robot Dreams, obviously, but... Um, as far mm-hmm. as what's available to us. And you know what? I am so happy that Elemental is on this list. Yes. Like something that was un- that was such a surprise to us last year. And like mm-hmm. I'm just so glad that it's finally getting the love that it deserves. I know some people feel like it maybe it doesn't belong up there. There are so you know, you did you did notate some notable some s- notable snubs, which I do agree with. Yeah, and those snubs are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. We have the Super Mario Bros. movie, as well as Wish, the Disney animated classic that celebrated Disney 100 years. Um, maybe I not Wish, quite... but I, I, I agree with your list. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe not Wish, but I'm actually a little bit upset to see Robot Dreams up there and not Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. I feel like what they did with the ant, maybe the story wasn't as strong as some of the other ones up there, but what they did for the animation, I think that deserves something. So I'm hoping Robot Dreams just, you know, kind of blows me away on that because I think the the turtles are the real snub in that category. Like the 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 Super Mario Bros. movie was a movie made for kids, so I can understand like the story was not strong in there whatsoever. Um, and then Wish, Wish, we loved Wish. We really liked that movie, but we knew from the get-go it did not resonate with with the large audience. So I, I wasn't too surprised for it not being. There. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot with Wish to like, but I just my thing with Wish is that they. I feel like you know, and I talked about it at length in the review, but it was just rushed. If they had, mm-hmm. I felt like if they had taken the time and given us a stronger script, like that could have been Disney's lack for better term, shining star. 
Yeah. <laughs> they were playing there. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I mean, Disney themselves had a rough 2023 and we've talked about that in multiple episodes of blockbuster bombs, you know, box office failures, you know, things ain't landing right with Marvel and like it's, it's been rough. So, but at least Disney had a shining, the shining star they thought was going to be in wish end up being elemental. Yep. Pixar so. for the win again. <laughs> Pixar Again. saves the day. <laughs> <laughs> now, will it win? We don't know that uh, for sure. Yeah. It has a tough competition with all the other ones that we'll dive in again later in our uh, predictions episode in the next couple uh, in, in the, the upcoming weeks. Um, but other notable snubs to mention: we have zero nominations, as we said before, of the Iron Claw, Saltburn, Air, Ferrari, Origin, the new Ava DuVernay film. Uh, Priscilla and all of us strangers. All of these movies were highly rated, um, highly reviewed, highly looked at, and also were just received zero nominations for the Oscars for whatever reason. Um, a big shock, at least for me anyway. This I feel like this one hits a little personal, Ernesto. The big shock for me in the uh, best original score category <laughs> was with John Williams. John Williams' score. For Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny getting the Oscar nom. I I hate to say <laughs> that Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is now an Oscar nominated film. They had to give they had to give them something. I for the life of me. I mean, all of this right here is because of John Williams. And I want to play a score, <laughs> a, a piece of the score for okay. you. All right, uh, so I'm going to do that right now, and uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a snippet of the score, and then I want I'm going to then I'm going to come back, and then I'm going to tell you what I felt like should have been nominated and it wasn't, and it's it's a snub, and I'm going to tell you what that sounded like, and you tell me the big difference here, Ernesto. So first, we'll hear a little bit of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny from John Williams. Okay. All right, so we have that, and that right? And that's what John Williams is nominated for. That is what okay. John Williams is nominated for. I mean, they th- now what I believe they love John Williams. <laughs> they do love John Williams. I understand that. Now, this is what should have been because I've read articles about this. I'm, I'm not. I'm not alone in this saying this. What the nom should have gone to Daniel uh, Pemberton's score for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Oh, give it to me, and I'm gonna. I'm going to let you hear a little bit of that. I'm going to play two different scores. I'm going to bounce back to it. So this, I'm going to play the beginning of one and the beginning of another, and then I'll come back. So here, here's this. It's a good workout song. All right. I just played you two scores from Daniel Pemberton's just a little bit snippets from Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. You can hear the, all these different sounds that he's using uh, just to get the music. I recently just rewatched Spider-Verse the other day. Mm. And I was like, the score in this movie is incredible. And I would hate to not see it get an Oscar nom. Well, man, I guess we're going to have something to talk about more in our, what you're watching, because I also <laughs> just rewatched Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. That's it. Oh that is also God. in my you're you are predicting my what you're watching and I don't like it. That's fair. <laughs> I, like I want to be a, I want it to I, be a surprise. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, needless to say, I'm pretty upset about that because I really enjoyed the score out of any I any agree. any movie that came out last year. That score was like he he just threw everything 
including the kitchen sink into <laughs> that into that score and it sounded amazing all the different sounds that you hear the, the the scratching of the of you know the whatever DJs use the turn the there you DJs go. Use. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about you know he just, like, just wild sounds that were in this movie that just I felt like should have at least gotten the nom. And yet we have John Williams slow. And it's just like, I, I can't. And then, you, and then it goes Indy's back to. He's going to die. It's like <laughs> Be and also like, now. <laughs> like, and everyone. Da, 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 da. Like, okay. I'm, I'm not sure if it's been nominated or not, but we, that that's classic. And that's the thing. That's the thing with the Oscars. They love their classic shit. So Agreed. anyway, I digress. I get off the soapbox now. Um, lastly, it was a present, pleasant surprise to see Godzilla minus one earn one Oscar nom for best visual effects. Fun fact, it would now be the first time a Godzilla film received an Oscar nomination. Well, so warranted. I would have loved to have seen it slide in there for best international film, but I'll take it. I'll take, I agree. At least it got one. The same with RRR. Yeah. It got, it got one and it won. And I think Godzilla minus one has a good chance of winning. In my opinion, I think it, it, what it's up against, it's a tough race, but it has it has some legs to stand on. It, so. it is a really good movie. So that's all I'm saying. It, it's <laughs> my, my favorite of 2023. It's up there. I'm just saying. It's up It's there. worth the watch. It it's coming out for one week only in black and white, which I think would be interesting to watch it as like a classic monster movie. But when you think about like some of the crazy special effects, like when you see his back charge up and it turned blue, like you're not going to get yeah. that. You're going to get shades. You're just going to see shades. But if you haven't seen yeah. it in color, you're not going to like, I feel like the color obviously just gives it that more intensity. I'd be curious to see what the, what the feel, like what kind of feel you get it from it in black and white. I'm sure it would still be yeah, enjoyable. It, it, it looks cool from the trailer. And I love what they're, I love what they're calling it. It's like Godzilla minus one minus color. <laughs> I was like, Haha, see what you did there. <laughs> I see what you did there, and it's fantastic. I love it. Um, so, again, wrapping up, among the most nominations, Oppenheimer received 13, Poor Things received 11, uh, A Barbie earned 8, Maestro earned 7, and American Fiction, Anatomy of the Fall, The Holdovers, and The Zone of Interest all received 5 nominations. So, clearly, Oppenheimer with 13. That's a lot. Yep going to it and it, it, there's a good chance it's going to win quite a few of those um in there notably oppenheimer i don't believe was in there for special effects so mm. like i said even more reason why i think uh godzilla minus one could get it but again we'll talk about that in our predictions episode you can find all of the 2024 oscar knobs on our social media pages on facebook instagram and our threads page the winners will be announced um the winners of the 96 academy awards will be announced live on abc sunday march 10th and i will be watching very very uh intently and <laughs> i'm pretty sure i'm gonna i think you know and it's starting you know what i really like that it's starting mm. an hour earlier this year it is i'm old as fuck and i don't know if i can make it until like 11 or 12 o'clock i'll be watching it's like oh they're almost gonna do best picture <laughs> i know i don't know if i can make it i'm glad that they're making it available for old people or at least you know maybe they want to go to after parties earlier and that's you know what that's fine i would even be okay with a six o'clock time i know that means like three o'clock their time but that's fine <laughs> And that's just like, you know, why stop at seven? Why does it have to be an evening thing? Let's go to six. Why can't it be an afternoon? Who cares? It's Sunday. <laughs> what the fuck? People watch, crowd together, watch football games in the afternoon. Why can't we have yeah. ours in the middle of the afternoon? You know what? I'm fine. You yeah, know what? I'll take I, seven I, o'clock. That's fine. Seven o'clock is I'll fine. I'll take seven o'clock. I always, I, I love this time of year that we get to now. We, I mean, we were watching all these films leading up to the Oscars. Now we know the noms. Now it's now it's time to get to work. Um, and this is our time we get down to the live action shorts, the animated shorts, the documentaries, the doc shorts, the the, the kind of the quote unquote holdovers, the leftovers that we have left from <laughs> all the other ones, the surprises that we we now need to watch that we weren't planning on watching now. Um, and then we all compile that together into our Oscars predictions episode, which feels so rewarding to ready go year. through all that and then we we kind of just put it all out there and like okay we've seen all that we can let's dive into each nomination and then it feels like now to your point our super bowl 
watching the Oscars and like, I know everything I need to know about this. I'm yeah. ready. I'm ready for it. I can watch this with an informed decision. That's really what it comes down to is because we're, mm-hmm. you know, we love movies and this is our, this is our way to express our love. Like how people love watching football. Like I could watch yeah. this shit all day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and it's nice to be get pretty much we get like three months of this for the most part, like two, two and a half months yeah. of this, uh, because we start getting it with the Golden Globes and the critics. And then we start seeing Directors Guild and Screen Actors Guilds. And everyone has their own different award shows and kind of leading up to the big one, which is the Oscars. So very much looking forward to going down this journey and as well as our predictions episode. And of course, what we typically do during Oscars night is that we have live updates on our Instagram page at box office underscore pinches and our stories. We just post them live. I got these graphics loaded. Like I, I, I make like three different graphics just in case I don't know who's going to win. I'm going to make them all. <laughs> I don't mean, I don't know. We got to see what we're doing this year. I don't, I don't know. We haven't really discussed what exactly how we're doing. I guess it's going to depend on our, other responsibilities and see what yes. see what's gonna what's gonna happen on that May, night. If 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 we can, I would. I mean, we have yet to see it together. I think that'd be a lot of fun if we can. I mean, if to we be honest, together, if we can get it. together, I would love to do a live stream. That would I feel like a live stream. Yeah, yeah, we could just live stream it and just watch it together. Just have fun. Yeah, we have to see. You is. know, certain certain platforms you have to be. You have to have a certain number of followers. <laughs> <laughs> to do that, to have that capability, but I feel uh, I think uh, there are I think either it's either Instagram or Facebook, and we might be able to go live. So I don't know. Look out for that. I don't know. We're kind of just we're kind of just spitballing right here, right now. So we'll we'll yeah. if it if it works out, something could be working out in the future for that. Uh, but you know what else I'm excited for, Matt? I'm excited to see <laughs> you. Already know what I'm going to say. You, I'm excited to see you become Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you start doing, and I've talked about it before. Your your crazy detective work for us to see all this shit. You before we were recording, you were already giving me the lowdown. Like, all right, we're gonna have to do this. This is already available. It's like I've already made the list. The list is ready. <laughs> the list. The list is ready. I I literally spent between writing down everything about these Oscar noms and going down to Sherlock Matt. Uh, and going down to what we need to watch. I was I probably worked on this for about three and a half to four hours uh I just trying to it. trying to research everything so yeah i mean but also it's just a lot of fun it's just a lot of fun to do it, it. is and then we do it we, we come back each and every week to talk about movies and I, I don't regret any minute of it so uh but yeah we do have some work to do so but but uh, not as much as this is the most and i say it every yes. year but this is the most prepared you've ever been by next week we'll have watched all 10 best picture nominations and we've already Absolutely. knocked out way more of the list we can just focus on the shorts and the document, the bo- documentaries is usually the heavy hitters because it's usually like each one is its own film. Like it's a yeah. lot. It's usually yeah. a lot. <laughs> and and to your point, I feel like every year that we've been doing this and keeping up with it, we've been better at basically like I've, I'm reading articles since like July yeah. of like, hey, man, this this might be it. So we don't know until January, but let's just give it a shot. And I think going back to the Oscar noms, we. We, like for best picture, I think we 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 did good on reviewing past lives early because now that's a best picture nom. Anatomy of the Fall, we did a few few weeks back. That saved us as well. Um, and the only one that wasn't, and we did Killers of Flower Moon, which we also expected. And the only one that wasn't available to us was the Zone of Interest. So, and then American Fiction just came out about a week and a half ago. So we're gonna be talking about that later. And man, do I have things? I have a lot. There's a lot to talk about with that. <laughs> there really is. Um, so anyway, let's. Let's stick with the with more nominations, but move away from best picture because you can't talk about the best without mentioning some of the worst. And uh, and it's an annual tradition. The 44th annual Razzie nominations have been announced. The Razzie Awards are known are known for awarding the worst films and performances of the year. It's always pretty much. Uh, again, the opposite of what the Oscars are, and they always do it like their nominations came out the day before the Oscars, and they're they're going to be announcing the winners again the day before the Oscars. So with that, worst picture goes to The Exorcist, Believer, Expendables, Four, uh, Meg Two, The Trench, Shazam, Fury of the Gods, and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I'm not going to disagree with most of what's up here for worst picture. I yeah, think I the only one that I'm going to defend is Shazam Fury of the Gods. I, I don't believe it was that bless you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe it's up there for worst picture. I, 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 we, we reviewed it and we thought it was fine. 
I spot you again. Yeah, all right. I at least muted it that time. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, I no, I actually I agree with you. I mean, I thought Meg Two was fun. I thought it was a fun. Yeah, it was a like it was it. a fun movie. Like what 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 were you expecting from that movie? I guess is the better question. And then Shazam: That's Fury fair. of the Gods. It was fun. It was a fun movie. You know. Yeah, it was fun. I I, I think in some cases I felt like it was better than the original. And we and we talked about Correct. that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I mean, I went as far as not watching The Exorcist Believer and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. So Whoa. I'll take their word for it of being bad movies. Yeah, I agree. I mean, come on, who's gonna? I didn't. Who who realistically said I'm gonna watch like this Winnie the Pooh movie? That's gonna be it. That's gonna be my movie. <laughs> That's, gonna be... That's gonna be my movie of the year. <laughs> um, I will most likely watch Expendables Four. I wasn't expecting much out of it. Now, I mean, it was, I mean, they, those movies never get great reviews anyway, but I feel like it's lost its touch for sure throughout the years of what those movies are meant to be. Um, other notable no- nominations we have uh, for worst actor, we have uh, Russell Crowe for The Pope's Exorcist, another movie I did not see. Um, Vin Diesel in Fast X, which I find kind of funny. Um, Jason Statham for Meg 2 The Trench, and Chris Evans for Ghosted. <laughs> you watched Ron that, didn't nominated you? for worst actor. And you know what? I can almost agree with that because the, the, it wasn't great. The movie was not great. Um, I'm surprised. I, like, honestly, you take replace Ghosted with Shazam. Like if if we're gonna be you know if we're mm. we're doing that list, like if you already gave it to worst actor, I'm gonna say it's for worst actress as well. Um, yeah, just just put just put that movie in, not Shazam. I don't think it deserved it. Um, uh, while worst actress went to Ana de Armas and Ghosted, Salma Hayek and Magic Mike's Last Dance, Megan Fox and Non Expendables Four, a movie called Johnny and Clyde. Don't know what that is, but. I guess she wasn't great. Sure. <laughs> um, Jennifer Lopez in the Netflix movie, The Mother, and Dame Helen Mirren uh, for Shazam, Fury of the Gods were all nominated for Worst Actress. Again, I, I, I don't think they're in the right path for Shazam, uh, but I can't speak to Ana de Armas and Ghosted. And I think in a, a different category, <clears throat> excuse me, in a different category, they're like Worst Chemistry. <laughs> Uh, in the movie and I was like yeah no I agree with that like it, they their chemistry did not land and I told you about the movie is like Chris Evan was playing a person like an average man who like his his the girl the girl that he's been seeing is a secret spy and he's like the average man and she's kicking ass and I'm like that's not believable <laughs> sorry Chris Evans you are not the average man no he's definitely not <laughs> I mean you're literally you, Captain America <laughs> yeah and we, like you you can't tell me after a decade of watching you be a superhero that all of a sudden you're gonna pay like oh my god it's no, all the guns and like I'm so afraid no. or maybe that was the joke yeah. or maybe that's the joke I don't know. I, then it didn't land. <laughs> it didn't <laughs> land at all. Um, uh, also notable, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania and Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny were both nominated for Worst Prequel, Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, no, we don't have to really like, dive into deeper in that. We, we've talked about this. Those were both movies that were in our disappointed list. And so, yeah, checks out. Yeah. Um, you can find the full list of the 44th Razzie nominations um, at Razzies.com. The winner will be allowed. The winners will be announced the day before the Oscars on Saturday, March 9th. Um, so from the biggest movie nominations to the biggest TV winners uh, after a let's see, October, November, after three months or maybe three and a half months of delays, the 2023 Emmy Awards um, were finally the winners were finally announced for the 75th annual Emmy Awards. Uh, let's start with the drama categories. I mean, it, we, we talked about this with the Golden Globes. They've been pretty much sweeping. Uh, Succession winning for Best Drama Series, Best Actor for Killian Culkin, uh, Karen Culkin, uh, Best Actress for Sarah Snook, and Best Supporting Actor for Matthew McFadden. Um, yeah, it, I mean, we've talked about this before. Uh, Ernesto, you've seen the series. I can't believe you we, still haven't we, watched you, it yet. I know we're getting there. I promise sure. it's up there on the list. I, I... <laughs> I'm starting to not believe you. Do you like movies and television? Because I don't think that you do. <laughs> or are you waiting for Megan? If you're waiting for Megan, then I understand. I'm not. 
that. Mm, then I, then you actually have no excuse. You are. I don't have an excuse. I don't. I don't know if you are a box office binger, Matthew. I don't, oh, I'm just wow. kidding. I take. I take that back. Oh, oh. I immediately. Oh my god, it's so hard. I, I immediately regret it as soon as soon as the words left my mouth. I was like, nope. I didn't. I don't mean, know. I didn't sometimes mean that. when you say, sometimes when you say it, it you meant it. I'm sorry. I heard a little bit. Anyway, take, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna move past it. I'm just gonna move past take, it. All right? I take it back. Okay. Just watch Succession. All right. <laughs> Watch the session, I'll forgive you. Um, uh, for best supporting actress in a drama series, Jennifer Coolidge won for The White Lotus. I think it's worth noting, however, that these nominations are for the previous seasons of what's already been out. So The Bear, all the awards have been getting, it's for season one, not for season two. What? Succession, the awards they've been getting have been for season three, not season four, because they stopped the cutoff. I think it's from like June to June of mm. of that year. So it's June of 22 to June of 23. And then the awards would have been in September of 23. And it got delayed to 24. So the bear, I believe, came out after the, the bear season two came out after that deadline. Mm. So. So they've been they're all being awarded for one. And I don't know where Succession landed, if it was the for the final season or for the third season. It really depends on when that was on the air as well. But like we could be seeing the 2024 Emmys and we're basically seeing the same shows winning again. Wow. Interesting. Uh, yeah. That's why Jennifer Coolidge won for a show that was technically in 2022. Yeah. Uh, because the White Lotus was in 2022, season two. Uh, but anyway, moving on from that, the Bear also took home four w- awards uh, for best comedy series, best best actor for Jeremy Allen White, best supporting actor for Eben Moss, uh, Backrack. Backrack, thank you, and uh, best supporting actress for Eo Eo Edaberry, Ed- thank you. Um, and then again, Abbott Elementary won uh, best actress for Quinton Quinta Brunson. That was for season one, not for season two. Mm. Okay, so, so twenty twenty four, we're gonna see, we're gonna see, we're gonna see more. That's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna be kind of interesting. That I don't, I don't yeah. it's kind of weird. I think it's very weird, in my opinion. But yeah, but anyway, Quint, uh, Quinta Brunson won for best actress for Abigail Montre. Also, all warranted. Also, the cast of of the Bear again makes complete sense. Yeah. Uh, for in limited series categories, uh, we had Beef kind of dominating again. We had. Best limited series, best actor in a limited series for Stephen Young, and best actress in a limited series went to Ali Young, uh, Young, uh, Wong. Sorry, Ali Wong. Um, yeah, all of these, all these three shows: Succession, The Bear, and Beef, dominated in Golden Globes, critics, and now the Emmys. Uh, it's uh, these. Apparently, these were the three shows to watch mm. uh, because they all dominated. And I'm still behind on Succession, even though I haven't started yet. Um, I forgive you. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 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 best supporting actor went to Paul Walter Hauser um, for Blackbird and his performance in Blackbird, which is a show that you watch and you said you really enjoyed. Fantastic! His performance is well warranted for that award. And also, uh, best supporting actress went to uh, Nancy Nash Beats. Oh, for, uh, who for Dahmer Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story? Uh, again, a show. Two of those shows that were. Back in 2022, they're now getting awarded for it at the Emmys. So it's it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. They were in these shows. But, yeah, the Emmys is a little bit behind, and they have a weird system. I think they should change it. Yeah. Uh, but re- <laughs> but regardless, those are the the Emmy winners. A little bit delayed, but here you are, all warranted. Again, if you saw Succession, The Bear, or Beef, you pretty much saw the Emmys and all their winners there. Um, so, yeah, there you go. All right. So now... We are going to move on to some non-awards news. We're going to start with Mr. Tom Cruise. We talked about it recently, about him mm-hmm. signing a deal with WB. Uh, he signed a deal with WB Discovery to star and develop and produce theatrical films. These films will be a mix of original production and franchise films, of part of what's being billed as a new strategic partnership. This will not be an exclusive. This will not be an exclusive deal with WB Discovery. Cruise can make movies at other companies, but the hope is that he will be able to generate the kind of globally appealing blockbusters that could spawn sequels and enhance WB's bottom line. Cruise is currently shooting Mission Impossible 8 and is rumored to be developing 
Top Gun 3 with Paramount. Cruz is also working on a film with Universal that ex- is expected to be shot at the International Space Station. It could be a while before we see a Tom Cruise film from WB Discovery. I think this is interesting news. This man is just, he has his, he has no plans of slowing down. He's no. just like in fifth gear the whole way. He's like, <laughs> I'm going to be the next superhero. For, you might as well just call me WB, man. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, seriously. Um, it is crazy. I mean, this isn't the first time that he's worked with WB. I'm pretty sure Edge of Tomorrow is a WB film. And so, like, I mean, Tom Cruise has notoriously been all... He, he makes his own movies. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter which which production company he's going at. Um, I mean, he Universal, he did the Alpha film that was The Mummy, but he did work for Universal already. So, um, but primarily with Top Gun and um, and Mission Impossible... Uh, those were all Paramount films. So he's mainly worked with Paramount probably because he had free range to do whatever the hell he wanted um, with these movies. And so now I, again, the fact that he is actively working on mission impossible eight, he's rumored to be developing top gun three, whether he's in it or not, and who's the cast has remained to be seen. But there were talks of, I think I saw a headline that they brought back the writer to start working on a draft. So, but nothing official has been confirmed yet. Um, and the fact that uh, we talked about this already, but he was working for the film for, for universal at the, the ISS. He wants to be the first actor to film in space. And he's probably going to do it. <laughs> and he's, pro- he's probably going to do it. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I feel the timing of this news is interesting given that there's probably a good five years before he even starts working on a WB film. And then another three to two to three years after that, before we even see what comes out of this deal. But Warner Brothers is like, yeah, no, we'll wait. Yeah. This is WB is just telling everybody like, hey, we got other shit besides DC. We look, we're going to make a Tom Cruise universe. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever that means to develop original and franchise films. And he said he's going to star in them too. So, and he's like, what? 60s by now? I'm sure that he's like, this is the franchise I've always wanted to do my whole life. <laughs> I, it, I, it is, it will be interesting to see, like, like Top Gun was basically his movie and Mission Impossible have turned into his movies, but I wonder under Tom Tom Cruise on maybe an original uh, property, like completely original. I'm curious to see what he can come up with. Uh, um, so am I. Uh, I guess goes. good on Warner Brothers for snagging Tom Cruise, even though any like also it's crazy that because most people sign an exclusive deal with the studio. Mm. That's that's pretty much the main case. But Tom Cruise is one of those actors that, you know, he has a lot of pull. So he doesn't want to make an exclusive deal. He doesn't have to. What if he's going to start telling Scientology stories. Well, <laughs> I can see that too. <laughs> to our next story. Sorry, <laughs> I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, we're gonna move on because there's a lot. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's talk about Star Trek, guys. <laughs> a new Star Trek film is in the works at Paramount with Andor and Black Mirror director Toby Haynes on board to direct, with Seth Graham Smith, who directed the Lego Batman, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and Dark Shadows, writing the script. Uh, while plot details are being kept under wraps, the upcoming film will be an origin story that it's set decades before 2009 Star Trek, as well as an expansion of the Star Trek universe. J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot is producing. Meanwhile, Star Trek IV remains in development, with the studio describing describing it as the final chapter. No word yet on a director, writer, or if the original cast is set to return. Well, I mean, that's interesting. I, you know, that's the thing that really got me interested in Star Trek was... Um, was these films and yeah just another hint to my what you're watching i'll be, be i'm gonna be talking about um the paramount show strange new worlds because it, it was it Ooh. was nominated for the critics choice so it, and it got me i was like well let me you know i'm not a big trekkie i've heard that this is like a, the beginning of it this is like the uh, one of like the where it begins and i'm sure maybe people real trekkies are like no that's not where it starts. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. This is what I was told. <laughs> so, but uh, it's in, I we'll see. Well, I'll have a. I have things to say. Not too much about the new Star Trek show. But as far as this goes, I mean, I'm for it. I'm all for it. 
Yeah, I I also I like Andor. I like episodes of Black Mirror. I'm pretty sure I didn't write it down, but I'm pretty sure Toby Haynes directed the Nosedive episode, Ooh. the one that starred Bry, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard. Mm. Um, I could be wrong. I'm going to double check because I feel like I am wrong now. I'm questioning myself uh, on which episode of Black Mirror he did. Uh, so we... Joe Wright directed that. Or maybe he wrote it. Oh, so no, okay, let's see here. He directed two episodes. Oh, oh my God, this makes complete sense. He So he did not do Nosedive. I was wrong. He directed the USS Callister episode. Well, it's <laughs> that tracks. Ooh, that, so you know what? You know what I would love to see? I would love to see Jesse Plemons attached to this project. Yes. Yeah, that will be interesting. If he can bring Wait, him back for that, I would love to see. All right. Plemons, Jesse Plemons, excuse me. Jesse Plemons, yes, yeah. You said that tracks. I think you meant to say that tracks. Ha ha. Ha ha. You're welcome. Thank you. You're just, you're full of them today, man. You're, I, you're, you're on a roll. Right. <laughs> uh, he also directed six episodes, <laughs> six episodes of Black, uh, sorry, uh, six episodes of Andor out of, I believe, 12. So he directed half of Andor. So like, yeah, if he can bring all of that to a Star Trek film, absolutely. Let's do That's, it. Let, let's do it. That makes me... I didn't realize it was USS Callister. I should have wrote that down. Um, but yeah, that that excites me. And the fact that they're still working on a Star Trek 4, good on them. Because they've been working on that for a while. Who knows which movie still is going to come first. But sure, let's, let's stay in the universe. Let's keep building up the Star Trek brand within the movies, I should say. Because um, I like those movies. Yeah. So I'm, I'm okay with this. This all sounds like a good By idea. By the time it comes out, it's going to be about Chris Pine's character retiring. It's going to take so long for that movie to come out. <laughs> that was a cheesy one. Um, <laughs> it, I, I will be curious, however, if they decide to bring in Chris uh, Hemsworth in uh, for the prequel film, they said decades before, so probably not. Mm, um, but technically, or like a Chris younger Hem- version of the same character, like somebody who's of the yeah, same, somebody who looks like yeah, because Chris, <laughs> yeah, because Chris Hemsworth was the father. He played a, a brief cameo um, before. This was like right, right before Thor, um, but he was the father to uh, what Chris Pine ended up yeah. being. So they could they could go about that way, but they said decades, so maybe not. So we'll, we'll see what they end up doing with it. But I'm down as far as the behind the scenes stuff. We're good. The fact that we have a Lego Batman movie writer, uh, it, it shows like they maybe want to do a little comedic take on yeah. it. So it's got a, they've got a good team behind them. So I'm looking forward. Yes, to it. absolutely. All yes. right, so let's talk about our final story. That is. Uh, <laughs> A new Jurassic World movie is in development at Universal Pictures. David Cope, who wrote 1993's Jurassic Park and its sequel, The Lost World, is attached to write the screenplay. That's that's the that's the that's the that's the, that's the little silver lining in this. <laughs> um, this will be Cope's first time returning to the franchise since '97. The 1997, the film will have an all new storyline that is intended to launch a new era of the franchise. Steven Spielberg will once again be an executive producer through his Amblin Entertainment production company. No director is attached yet, and it is uncertain if any of the previous actors will return for the new film. Um, sure. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, I mean, come on. The last one, but. The last two. Yes, the last two were not good, but it's like, so are you starting another set of trilogies? Is that is that is that what I'm getting from this? Because that's yeah, kind of that, what it sounds like. <laughs> that is the key word there, and the fact that David David uh, Dave, Keop? Cope. I just read it as Cope. K O yeah, K O E P P. You have a better sense than I do. Um, <laughs> I David say. Cope. The fact that he wrote the first two films, which the first one obviously is a classic. Iconic, yes. Second one. Not, not, not but too still, bad. But still, but still decent. The second one is still decent. Still decent. Yes. Me, me personally, I'm, I'm, I, I I'm a, as far as the three original films, I'm a, I'm a, a, a one, three, two guy. I, yeah. Uh, may, that, that list might change, but right now, no, sorry. I, what, why did I say that? I'm a, yeah, no, one, three, two. No, I said that right. Yeah. One, three, two. That's what you said. Um, <laughs> that's what I said. For some reason, I thought I said three, two, one. I was like, that's, that's, that's not, not what right. I said. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I said. Um, but, you said that was a silver lining, and I want to read you, Ernesto, his writing filmography, okay? okay? Because I thought that was a silver lining as well, but I want to go back, and I'm going to I'm gonna read you a few movies, and you tell me... Matt, are you going to ruin you, it for me? Yes. 
<laughs> okay. So he was responsible for, um, I believe this was, a, 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 yeah, Robert Zemeckis. So before he did Jurassic Park, he did Death Become Her, a Robert Zemeckis film, which was pretty solid. Then he did the Jurassic Park, instant classic. Then he continued on his train. He did the screenplay for the first Mission Impossible film. So he helped kick it okay. off. Right. Then he then he did the Lost World, right? Then he did the Panic Room, that was, I believe, the David Lynch film starring Jodie Foster, Great David movie. Fincher film, starring Jodie Foster, right? Okay, you're with me so far. Yes, I am. He did he did the screenplay for Spider Man, the original Spider Man. Toby, okay. Toby, I'm not Toby hearing Spider-Man. bad things, Matthew. I think he, then he did Secret Window with uh, Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. Mm. I, yeah. Okay. I and then he did he did Zathura. A space adventure. I like that movie though. I like Zathura. It's okay, a, it's, a, it's good. He he did War of the Worlds, the Tom Cruise uh, the one? Steven Spielberg film. Did the Tom Cruise one with Steven Spielberg? Yeah. I'm not hearing bad things. Uh, these are and decent. then he did Indiana Jones and the Crystal mm. and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Mm. I haven't seen it, but you you do you do not say good things about that movie. He followed that with Angels and Demons, the uh, uh, Tom Hanks uh, biblical mystery films based off no, the books biblical. it was based off the the da vinci code books yeah, it's not, the, yeah that what, what would you, it's not biblical what, it's like i'm what, do you, what would you religious? call that religious thr- like yeah, religious thriller like a religious thriller religious yeah yeah there you go um so he did angels and demons he also wrote premium rush that movie that bike movie with uh jason gordon um uh, oh jason uh, gordon levitt joseph gordon i know of it yeah, but yeah. i didn't see it he also did then uh jack ryan shadow recruit um, starring uh, Chris Pine, which was not favored very well. Um, he also then finished off with Inferno. Uh, so he did. He wrote two and three of this Da Vinci Code uh, trilogy there. And then he went off and did The Mummy, the Tom Cruise movie, the one, the one we just talked about, the bad one. Mm. Yeah, he did that. Mm. Um, and then he did a movie called Kimmy, which was from Steven Soderbergh, I'm pretty sure, which was on Max that nobody heard of, and it was awful. I watched it, and it was not good. <laughs> it was so bad, I chose not to talk about it. Wow. And then his most recent credit was Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. He wrote that, he wrote that movie? I'm sure, we, so yes. I'm sure we've said his name before. Uh, yes, we have. So he is responsible for two of the worst Indiana Jones films, The Mummy film that was not good from Ryan Reynolds. And however you want, it's not Ryan Reynolds, sorry, Tom Cruise. And however you feel about the last two of the Angels and Demons and Inferno Da Vinci Code trilogy. So I'm not saying he's not capable of writing good stuff that sound because like I went saying. down his... <laughs> it sounds like, sounds like you don't have much faith in him. <laughs> what I'm saying is that, yes, in the past, he has written good things. More recently, not so much. Mm. So the fact that he's going back to this property, maybe he has something to say. And all I'm hoping for is that it actually promised or delivers on what Dominion should have been. It should have been the dinosaurs interacting with the humans in present day. The thing is that like, they marketed the last Jurassic World movie as the end of the franchise, right? The was end of an era. The end of an mm-hmm. era. That was literally the whole big hype is that this is the end. Like, this is yes. it. This is how this franchise is ending. So now, yep. literally, everything that everybody thought leaving the movie means absolute horseshit. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yes, yes, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you see, the, you see the, the thing is, Ernesto, there's a little thing called money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get on my soapbox. I already feel it. No, I'm. Yeah. I just. Why can't we come up with something inspired by Jurassic World? Like, why can't we come up with something original that that is inspired from the Jurassic Park franchise? Like, why can't See, we just leave that's it alone? Not, it's not. So it was funny that you brought that up because you remember Camp Cretaceous? Yeah, the kids show on Netflix. The, the, yeah, they they ended it four seasons. Until they didn't, because now it's coming back for another one. And so it's like, all right, so we 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 led up to this final chapter, but they call they're calling it something else. It's like Jurassic World something. So it's not called Camp Cretaceous anymore. So it's they're basically introducing it as a new show instead of a season five. So I guess you can see it however you want. It's a spin-off now. But we're also seeing older versions of those characters that we continued. We're, we're following this at least the same one character so 
interesting to see how that goes. But needless to say, Ernesto, when they said they were done with Jurassic Park and the world or Jurassic World, I should say, they lied. <laughs> they're liars. I, 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 they're liars. See, but that makes I, me but that makes think... me not want to watch this at all. I mean, not that I was excited for it to regardless because the last movie was dog shit. So right. like this, I don't know. I'm just not in. I'm I, not. I was slightly interested in the beginning, and I don't know. It's got to be a banger of a trailer to make me come back to Jurassic World. I'm, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. I will say that again. If if we do not bring Brat, if we don't bring back Chris Pratt or Bryce Dallas Howard or any of the, if this is actually a fresh take on where Dominion left off, I might be more interested than yeah. Because I feel like because we can we can deliver a good Jurassic World like indie film, like okay. like pretty much like do what like Godzilla minus one did. Like right, I'm listening. Like, I'm listening now. You know what I mean? It's like it 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 has it. Oh, this franchise always has room, but it gets it it gets in its own way of being like these big blockbusters where it doesn't always need to be. Let's bring it back a little bit. That's a director. So, that's a director they need. If, if they're, oh, they need they yes. need to, if they want this to, for me to lock in early, you get the Godzilla minus one director to direct this film. There, well, I guess we'll see. I mean, I think it'll be very telling to see how this movie might go when they attach to a director on it. Again, obviously, we need more information, and this is most likely in the early stages. Probably won't see anything come out of this until what, maybe three years from now, yeah, it'll be a while. most likely. Yeah. Um. So there's that. But anyway, that's all the entertainment news we have for you guys this week. As always, you can find all the latest and breaking news on our social media channels on Instagram at box office underscore bingers and our Facebook and threads page at box office bingers. We'll post all the news over there first, and then we'll come back in the show and we'll talk about it. So with that, we dive in to a fun segment I like to call What You Watch. And Sir Ernesto, you've given us teases already. Let's hear what you've been Guess watching. Guess what? My first one is something I haven't even mentioned yet. I I started and finished. I watched the whole season of Ted, the new show, the prequel series on Peacock. I I don't know. Uh I was just I was just really interested. I mean, ever since yeah, ever since the Orville, I felt like I just got a newfound appreciation for Seth MacFarlane as a creator. Sure. I mean, and I loved early days. The first Ted was was a was a funny movie of its time. I don't think it could be made now. But maybe this show coming out. (laughs) And being successful, it's actually having, you know, there's been written, it's been doing pretty well uh, streaming wise. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not, it's not bad. I, I, there's some off color humor as, as all, as most of his work is like, it's, right. this is pretty much a live action version of family guy. Like even, <laughs> it even does the, it, I mean, it's so reminiscent. It has like the mute, you know, like that, like that. Like that musical intro in between every scene, yeah. and like like mm-hmm. that style of music is the is the intro. It's the exact same. It's not the exact same song, but it is the exact same feel. Like you feel like you're watching Family Guy. Like in, even <laughs> even in, in the dialogue, you're watching it, and it's that same back and forth. And then they're talking about a flashback, except you don't always go back to the flashback. Sometimes you just sit there, and then and then they're talking about it, which which was fine. I mean, collectively, it was it was okay. I I, I was was able to laugh out loud certain at certain points okay it's only seven episodes um i i would probably i'd probably watch season two but this is very much a turn your brain off and watch but what i something i did kind of enjoy is i like there were certain episodes that like like oh there's actually a message here like it wasn't ac- mm. it wasn't completely mindless like there was an actual narrative and like the characters actually like learned the lesson at the end of it so it's like <laughs> no if to me that t- that was a surprise to me because i fully expected it to just be seven episodes of nonsense and there was and to be fair there is some nonsense in there some of it works some of it doesn't but overall right. it wasn't bad you, you know sorry i you, and you know what caught my eye? I was I was watching you on the screen, and right above me, right here, you got Ted. Is he? Oh, it's cut. Your screen cuts him off a little bit, but I see. Oh, but I see. And he's far away. But I see it now. You have you have the Ted then, Funko. That's hilarious. And then right next to him, oh, the next one over here, uh, is John Ham, uh, uh, John Hammond in the Jurassic Park Park movie. 
So we were just talking about that. Just it's right there. So if you're telling me that baby driver is next on your list, then that's going to be really freaky. <laughs> it's it's definitely not. Uh, but the next okay. one, the right. next well, short, short lived, <laughs> short lived, but it, but it still works. Well, hold on, be, sorry, go, go back to Ted for a second because I haven't started it yet. But you talked about, um, uh, you talked about uh, having respect for Seth MacFarlane because of the Orville, and I think that's interesting now going into like a pure comedy sense and seeing what he was able to bring maybe from his work on the Orville and the Family Guy series, and now bringing this into a live action comedy, which a lot of people thought that the Orville was going to be. Mm. And then now it turned out to be not that whatsoever. So now we see a true comedy sense that probably what most likely people are going to expect from a Seth MacFarlane, um, you know, production. And it just, it just seems like so on the nose, like to come out with something like this, that you clearly know in our culture and just the way everything is now, like this is something that you have to be so careful with. Cause like yeah. you can't, you couldn't make the first Ted movie. And I, now, yeah. but I think this is his way of saying, yeah, you can. And this is, and this is how you do it. <laughs> Cause yeah. And, and it walks the line. It definitely of... walks the line. <laughs> Okay, but it's good though. It's been getting a lot of it's been getting like mixed, but mainly positive reviews on it. Yeah, um, it's definitely a show I wanted to watch. I saw again, it's on Peacock. It's only thirty minutes. I'm pretty sure. Oh no, um, there are certain and, episodes that are forty minutes, certain episodes that are fifty uh, minutes. Oh, they're longer. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't expect that actually. I thought they're going to be solid thirty minute episodes. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, but I do, I do find it interesting to see Seth MacFarlane work on this and uh i'm i'm gonna watch it i'm good I, I i always had my interest to see what this could be and um yeah i guess you beat me to it and i because i was mainly curious is like can you do that today like because of how like it didn't really age well with ted and now may, maybe you know he might get a second season it's been you know the ratings have been pretty well for him so i'm, I'm curious and i'll be curious to hear what your thoughts on it mm, okay all right. So moving on, as I kind of mentioned briefly mentioned before, I started, you know, I started Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I actually fit, just finished the first season and I, I enjoyed it. You know, each episode is like a it's very it kind of it just reminds me of the Orville. And I guess. Yeah. And I guess that's, you know, because the Orville was inspired by Star Trek. By Star yeah. Trek. Yep. So, yep. I mean, it works. It, it works it, as original team. I, the, my only gripe is that I feel like there's fan service in the sense of like where like they'll hold on something and then they'll say something and then it'll be silent like oh am i supposed to know i feel like i'm supposed to know what they mm. just i feel like i'm supposed to know what they just said and they're hinting as callbacks to people who have who are really invested and know a lot about the lore where it's like me trying to use this as a jumping on point where i felt like i was missing out on little things that they were hinting at um, but other than that, as as far as like an original story, if you wanted to use this as a jumping on point to watch Star Trek, I think it works really well. And the cast is great. Yeah. Um, fight the some of the action scenes are are, are done really well, and uh, each episode kind of works as like a, a thing of the week. And I'm excited to kind of dive into the second season, which is available on Paramount right now. I so what's crazy about this show is that I you know I feel like Discovery. I feel like I was behind. Um, and I never, I saw, like, I was watching an episode with Chris one of the days and was like, I, I feel like there was just a lot going on. I feel like it was a continuation in this. And I tried the same thing with Picard. I saw the first season. I feel like I was really behind on what was going on there because again, it was a continuation. I feel like that Star Trek for me was always a thing that if I really wanted to get into it, I had to have watched all this stuff, but strange new worlds always got my attention, even though I haven't started it yet because of the fact that like, oh, this is like old school Star Trek episodes where it was like mission of the week. And uh, that's what I've always heard about it. And I've also heard it was a great jumping on point for the franchise as well. So I'm excited to hear that you think it's really good. The fact that it, it is saying exactly what other people were saying. Um, and so I, I've been waiting on Megan for this one, but eventually I'll, I'll get to it. It. I'm I'm excited. I, I I'm excited to see what happens in the second season. Um, I'm kind of curious to see like now that I've done this, like I wonder what else I can like mm. like should I go back to the original? Like it's gotten me interested to look at other at other Star Trek properties to see which maybe which other one to watch, which other one and to watch. It's, it's crazy Next, how like what I should say. Yeah, it's crazy how like you know start. This is 
from what I heard, very reminiscent of the old school Star Trek. But you said it was very reminiscent of the Orville, which is also reminiscent of the old school Star Trek episodes. So I, I think there's a formula there that intrigues at least us diving into this franchise that like that style of Star Trek we're able to consume and ingest easily than trying to understand the bigger scope of what that universe is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. So excited to see that. And then also what I mentioned previously is I watched Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse because Hannah had never seen it. So oh, wow. we put it on and we all we all watched it. Even even Bella. Eli didn't last as long, but <laughs> Bella, she sat there and she watched the whole thing. And, you know, I feel like I... I still I still feel the same way whereas like I feel like I wanted more of a complete story like cuz I, I you know I go back and I rewatch it and I think well what is you know my take the originally was you know it's only half the story and yes that is true but then what is the yeah. story of this one and I think it's mm-hmm. of like obviously Miles discovering that he was a mistake and like the whole chain reaction of that so of him trying to find himself because you get that whole scene of him separating himself from the spider society and kind of going as like the lone ranger spider-man a, a break away from the entire other spider-verse um i my feelings are still the same but i do have a newfound appreciation and i do agree with you that score I mean, it's just slap. It's so good, and it, the film is just so good. I mean, the the messy it, animation when you go from yeah. different when you go from the different worlds, the animation you get to see. It's just it's just an enjoyable movie through and through. And, and like as I said, I, I also rewatched it again, and it it it's just so good. Yeah, it is. The good. story is so strong. The fact that it takes roughly forty minutes before we even start diving into the other worlds. Like you, they take the time to you to get reinvested into the story, to the characters, what the characters are feeling and dealing with right now before they even get to the whole spider society of it all. And then when we finally get there, we're given like, what does it mean to be Spider-Man? It's a canon event, all this stuff. And you're like, wow. Like when you really dissect Spider-Man, this movie does an incredible job doing that. And it it feels like, like, I mean, also what it's doing just diversity wise, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, and um, my daughter, who was five, sat through the entire movie and enjoyed it and understood it. So that's to say, yeah, like how well they constructed the narrative that was even to break it down even to different age groups. Mm-hmm. It's I, I feel like between the first two movies, I can watch these movies all day. Yeah, I can absolutely rewatch this movie over and over again. Yeah. All right. And to round out my list. I watched Coleman Domingo and Rustin, which mm. which which mm-hmm. was a really, I mean, absolutely enjoyable movie. It's showcasing the lead up to Dr. King's pivotal march on March on Washington and Rustin's inv- inv- involvement of it. And he, um, it, it was it was really good how they showcased the time. I think in a less stacked Oscar year, this could have been up for possibly other awards. There's a lot, but interesting. But, Coleman Domingo is absolutely the standout in this film. Every time that he's on scene, you're just completely enthralled in everything he has to say and his delivery. Also, Chris Rock gives a, a surprisingly really, really good performance. Um, oh. Just a really, really well-constructed film kind of just showcasing like everything that went into the March on Washington. You, you actually end up learning like, I felt like it was a little bit of a history lesson and it was, I mean, it was yeah. great. And I think it served, it served this purpose. It showed the importance of this man. Interesting. I mean, obviously he got the Oscar nom and well deserved. Rust, Rust, he did not, re- Rust in the film did not receive anything else, but his nomination his his, um, his lead after role. Yeah. Um, and these are rumors, by the way, these are very much rumors. I'm not here to spread rumors, but we are, you know, we're talking about them. He is rumored to maybe replace Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. It's like an older Kang? No, as like just straight up replace. Um, I mean, Which, I can see it. A, a lot of people were excited about this particular rumor. Um, and now given the Oscar nom and what he's done in this film... Maybe there's some legs to stand there. I don't know if he would want to. I don't know if he can give that gravitas. I can't speak to his performance in this film. Obviously, it'd be very different. But regardless, um, I'm very much looking forward to watch this movie uh, because 
it was it's been on my list for a while and i knew that he's been a standout in this film yeah um yeah it was uh it was really enjoyable and i okay what i now as far as him being king it would be fine my issue my issue wouldn't be with him being king my issue would be them pursuing the king storyline in general if they did if they right. did if that yeah. is what they end up doing so if he does mm-hmm. get king i think that'd be great because he's a i mean i every time anything that he's ever been in i've always really loved he's a fantastic actor like um oh, he's absolutely so, he's so good in everything he's in so my issue wouldn't be with him my issue would be with the the story direction of that if of that news if it did if that did end up being true yeah, and that's that's fair. I can understand that. Um, but other than that, that's all I got this week. See, I told you, man. I told you I had look. I, I had a little bit of a list for you. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you very much yeah. did. Um, so I just want to let you give you just a heads up, Ernesto. Okay. We're starting from the top and we're working our way down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that that's what we're doing here. I I constructed this 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 the specific order because I'm I'm <laughs> I'm giving you from the highs to the lows. Ooh. So just remember that every time we go to the next thing I've watched, it just gets deeper into my I do not like Ooh, this. Oh, I could feel that. Uh, you're right. Okay, so we're going to start out with What If season 2. I saw all I believe 9 episodes. Yeah, I haven't finished um, it yet. I started it, but I haven't finished it yet. Oh, you started it? I started it? like How far I'm you... halfway through the first episode. Because <laughs> okay. this is a this is a me and Edward show. So Got we don't, it. you know, unfortunately I they just don't have a lot of time. <laughs> we keep yeah. we keep them really busy. <laughs> busy kids. But then I tell them, hey, let's uh, watch the show together. And then I never get to finish it. Still haven't finished still haven't <laughs> finished Andor either. <laughs> Uh, and what about have you finished Loki yet? Nope. I have twenty minutes left of the finale. Because that's a me, I, Hannah, I, and Edward show. Uh, that's a that's a trio right there. Well, see, see how much um, I love my family that I have that I have <laughs> I have not broken yet. <laughs> I'm about to say you haven't just like snuck on your phone real quick while it's a 20 minutes. Like, oh, we'll watch it eventually. But you're you're, you're too good. No, I won't do it to him. <laughs> um, I thought season two was fantastic. Better than one. I, I it, almost a little bit. Yeah, like one was kind of gearing toward like event. It was separate, but also together in a way. And s- season two kind of did something similar, but I think the standalone stories I was able to appreciate more. This was, I feel like more old school Marvel playing with a genre and giving us a movie out of it. Mm. And, or, and, and but that with what they were doing in the past is like uh, captain America winter soldier is more a political thriller. And then you have um, uh, Ant-Man being a heist film. And then you have um, uh, Thor and, uh, Thor Ragnarok kind of being like a buddy cop movie in a way. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but you, you get what I'm saying. Like they pick a genre and they give you like a moral flair to it. And I feel like they did something very similar to these. And I think they gave us interesting stories. And as I was going through each episode, which are roughly around 20, uh, 30 to 35 minutes, um, there was like titles where I'm like, like for one, for example, where it's like, uh, if what if Captain Carter fought a Hydra stopper? And I was like, that sounds stupid. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what that means. And then I saw the episode. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Like, basically what that episode was, was like, basically the Winter Soldier, if Captain Carter was was there instead of... So it's continuing off of, like, the first season where it's like, well, what if Captain Carter... Oh, okay. Uh, what what if Agent... You know, what if it was Peggy Carter who got the Super Soldier serum instead of Steve was in the first season. Now, basically, like, let's continue that. And, like, this is the Winter Soldier of it, but with... Peggy Carter as Captain Carter. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so we got a continuation off of that. We also got like a Christmas episode, which was kind of fun. Um, and we have like a like a like a space noir episode that very reminiscent of Blade Runner, Ooh. heavily inspiration off of that. So like they take some interesting uh liberties with these with this show. And I feel like I remember when Marvel was this and like this like ballsy. Mm of making like these movies back in the day. And I feel like what if is their Avenue to kind of do that? Because I feel like there's no pressure when you come to these, to these episodes and these, these, um, very, these, sh- very yeah, true. within these episodes the, they did something new for the first time, which I, which I really, really enjoyed. It's called if Cohorty reshaped the world, they introduce a new character um, and it's a new superhero based off of it, the, the description reads a Mohawk woman ventures into the waters of the forbidden lake. To save her people and it was more of the mohawk um native nation mm. and so the whole the whole episode was in their their native language like you had to read the entire episode oh. they really committed with like a it. foreign film episode. and that's fine like exactly 
And but they committed. I, I didn't expect them to do that. They committed throughout the entire episode of it. So I'm like, oh, good for you for doing that. And they introduced like a whole new concept to the Marvel universe we haven't seen before. And I was like, okay, so we're we're trying something new here. We're not just giving us stories that are like, what if this this? Like we even have like another fun one. Like what if uh, what was it? What if Peter Quill attacked Earth Mightiest Heroes? Mm. So basically. It's it's the what if where Peter Quill goes like he gets he basically like I would rephrase is like what if Peter Quill was delivered to his father mm. and what happened there. And so then Peter Quill comes back into attack Earth and in the 1970s. And who are your Avengers then in the 1970s within the Marvel Cinematic Universe? So I thought that was an interesting of how that kind of played oh, out. That's cool. And so like we had a lot of fun playing with these what if. And so I really enjoyed season two. They already confirmed for a season three. So they can keep pumping these out because this is a fun way to kind of play around the Marvel universe that they I feel like they will never be ballsy enough to do in the live action movies. Yeah. I'm I mean I'm here for it. I can't wait to finish it. Yeah, it's 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 some good content. I really did. Another one that surprised me was what if Hella found the Ten Rings? I wasn't expecting like that one, but it was a very interesting crossover. So, um, but moving on from that, we have the next, was it, which was the, what's the next film? Oh, the book of Clarence. Um, this was part of my double feature. I'll reveal the next movie, uh, later down my what you're watching. This was by, um, I want to get his name right. Uh, he, this is the same director who did the harder they fall, which is a Western based pretty much a Western. That's all black cast. And, uh, and his name is, um, Jamie Samuel. And I think I said that wrong, but he is the director, writer, and composer of both the harder they fall. And now the book of Clarence did terrible at the box office opened up at number nine. I didn't think it was going to get a lot of favorable fave there. Uh, but this, this director continues to put his unique flair and style into another genre with an all black cast. Mm. I had it, it. The story was not as strong as the heart of they fall again, that heart of the fall was more of like an all black Western. This is almost like a reimagining of the biblical tale of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's basically yeah, that's, that's what, what I got. Is. That's and, the feel I got from the, the trailer. And it like the music hits at the very beginning of the movie. Mm. It, it was like, I was like, damn, like this guy clearly as, as the writer, director and composer, you clearly see that he is writing very similar to James Gunn. The music matters in each scene. It's not an accident. It's not a needle drop. It is, it is it's planned and it's meant to be there with original songs. And it, it, it was a lot of fun to watch. The, my only problem with the movie, it was its tone. Mm. It went from a hard shift between a comedy and a drama. And it had a hard time with that. Like I had a hard time dealing with that. Cause there's moments where I'm laughing and then all of a sudden we're just like, boom, like hard drama. And I was like, wow, that's not ready for that. I wasn't expecting. Not ready. I was not ready for it. And then when we committed to it, I was like, oh, okay, this movie took a tonal shift as we got to the end. Mm. Um, and so like I, I personally wish they would have kept that 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 comedic route that they started because it was because it, it was good for what it was. Um, but for the most part, I enjoyed it more of like a three and a half for me on that movie. I, I did like it. Uh, I enjoyed it much than the other movie that I'll get to in a minute. Um, but anyway, moving on from the book of Clarence, we have, oh, okay. I, it, it's, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I saw Aquaman in the lost kingdom. It was bad, Ernesto. I don't remember exactly how you favored this movie. I think you were giving it a little bit of credit. Um, I, I, I I watched this movie with my mom because I was visiting my parents over the weekend and she wanted to see it and she loves Jason Momoa. So I was like, all right, we'll go see Aquaman. I'm literally sitting here. I was like, this movie is awful. Uh, but I, I walked out and my mom had a good time because it was Jason Momoa. So I was like, 
I think to, in your way, you are feel like, oh, it's fine. The family liked it. It's like, no, oh, it's it still sucked, but my mom liked it. So there's that aspect of it. Um, it I don't the st- the story didn't. I feel like it didn't matter. Like I just didn't care about anything that was happening in this movie. I like I rewatched Aquaman. To, to prep for this one. I feel like I cared a little bit what was going on. It was still stupid. Don't get me wrong. The first movie was still stupid, but I was able to connect with it just a little bit more. This one, none of it connected with me whatsoever. I did not like, it felt cheesy. Then it felt like we're trying to be serious. And then like, we have the brother and the escape and that was stupid. And then the whole fake out with the, like I took your baby and like, I thought the father was dead. Spoilers. I thought the, 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 the dad was dead. And it's like, no, we just patched him right up. I'm like, then what the most the stakes there? There was, there was no stakes whatsoever. It, like, I feel like it just couldn't connect in telling a cohesive story. And obviously they found a way to include and not include Amber Heard in the movie. Um, I, for me, she was fine of the inclusion they put in here. Obviously it was more of a, a brother relationship film. That's the, the driving force here. But like, even like the coolest stuff was, was obviously with Manta and when they were fighting, but then like that whole through line of like these dark forces taking over him was garbage. I did not like that at all whatsoever. It, I wasn't expecting one, but I at least expected a good ish story, at least a story I'm willing to follow. Yeah, I know. Fair. Yeah. Where 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 do you land on the uh on the, the official letter box rating on this? Yeah. Okay. I I think that's generous. Two is good. <laughs> um, but yeah, to your, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a nice guy. Um, I, I will say that um, this was a disappointing end to the DC EU for sure. Yeah. I, I, I wish they would have ended on better terms, but given, like you said, it had a rough production um, with everything that was going on. I, I expected just a little bit more from it, but DC had a rough year and we knew this was going to happen. If we did a recap, we had uh, Shazam, Fury of the Gods, The Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And if you would have asked me in the beginning of the year which movie I thought would have been the best, I would have told you The Flash. And now we see that it's most likely Blue Beetle, if if, if anything. And And that wasn't even over the moon for Blue Beetle either. Yes. <laughs> let's let's move on to the next one, shall we? Um, I saw the new movie Lift from Kevin Hart. <laughs> Ernesto, tell me the qualities of a good heist movie. Like any any quality of a good heist movie. Just name like at least one. Well, no, no, sorry. That yeah, those yeah, those are like characteristics, but like what is like the one thing you look for when you go watch a heist movie? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and so like you said, quick and and like witty. I think witty is a good word. I think um not not that. Uh it it wasn't funny. At least it was at least if it was trying to be, it failed. Um, when I think about a good heist movie, I'm thinking of you got at least likable characters that are clever. You also have a heist that is supposed to not only fool the antagonist, but also the audience as well, because there's always like a like a trick at the end of it. Like, oh, well, we did this, this little trickery. of Exactly. Like now you see me didn't have that in it, even though they tried and failed miserably. Um, and it's just like likable characters. And like to your said, those characteristics of like, here's your leader, your hacker, you're this and that. And I could not give two shits about any one of these people. Vincent D'Onofrio was also in this movie. He's like in the back corner there in the poster. And he was not good in this movie. It's, 
everything about this movie was just awful. Um, it's like my first one of like the first like letdowns of the new year is like Jesus, like not bad. It's a bad movie. <laughs> Any good quality of a heist movie is thrown out the window in this one. And like by the time we get to it, like the actual heist, I could care less at this point. I don't care anymore. Uh, it's actually quite surprising that F. Gary, F. Gary Gray directed this because he's come out with better movies than this. So I don't know where the problem landed with this movie. Uh, I just want to let's see F. F. Gary. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, well, I, I should have known better. He did Men in Black International. Did not catch that the first time. Mm. Not a good movie either. Um, he also, but the two movies I did like from him, he did Straight Out of Compton which was a fantastic movie. And he also did the fate of the furious. Uh, and I liked that. That was the eighth film in the fast and furious, uh, franchise. And I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Um, he also did law binding citizen, oh, which I was love, also a great, I movie. love that. That's a great movie. So how the hell did he get from all of that to men in black international and lift is beyond me. I don't know what happened there, but anyway, I guess I digress. Um, because not a good movie. And the last one, the worst of them all, Jason Stath- Jason Statham's The Beekeeper, directed by David Ayer. It looked terrible. Why, why did you think that movie was going to be good? Because people told me it was good. They li- and by they people, to I mean the Rotten Tomatoes score. Well, you already know how I feel I, about that. So. <laughs> they I, probably, I paid, for, they probably the rot- paid for those reviews. <laughs> I w- but it wasn't them. Like I heard too many consistent... I should like I did a double feature and it was the book of Clarence and the book and the and the beekeeper and I had watched the beekeeper first and I'm like man I really hope the book of the Clarence is something because this movie's hot garbage. <laughs> hot uh, garbage. They it basically tried to be John Wick mm. and failed with bees. With bees and Ernesto, when I tell you there were so many B puns, I wanted to punch this movie. Uh, well, it's it's it was like <laughs> it was like it was like the like using the term all these things buzzing around is like, oh I bet that stung. It's like get the fuck out of here <laughs> with those stupid B puns. Um the movie's sitting at a seventy percent critic score and a ninety-three percent audience score Mm. we must have seen a different movie because i i i I highly disagree with both the critics and the audience it it is not that good the acting is horrible in this movie jason thatham is probably the redeeming quality in here but he can only do so much as far as action wise because i'm past the point where action can carry my movie like Certain movies, sure. This one, no. And it, it's just such a stupid way of how we got to this. Because all of a sudden, like, um, there was an older woman played by a respectable actress. I forgot her name. Felicia. Um, uh, she was she was in the Cosby Show. Uh, she played the mother in the Cosby Show. Oh, I forgot her name. Um, but it's she played an older woman, and then she gets hacked, and. And then continue. The, she gets hacked, and then she lost all of her money. And then Jason Thasem has a personal uh, connection with this woman, and so he goes out of cover. Apparently, he's been undercover, or not out of, undercover, but he's been out of the business for a while. And the secret organization called the Beehive. <laughs> and then he goes on a rampage, kind of righting the wrongs of what this what this evil corporation did to this uh, woman who lost all of her money from a computer uh, hack. Felicia Rashad. Thank you, Felicia Rashad. Um, and then he goes off from that. And then it turns into like, wait, so now there's this secret organization with the Beehive. And now he's whipping out all these old things, like very similar to John Wick. Yeah. And I was like, no. And then like, there's one moment where the action was very like hands on like John Wick. And I was like, no, you you, you don't get to do that after giving me an hour of bullshit. <laughs> um, it, it was I, I, at the point, I was getting pissed off at this point. It's like, this movie does not even deserve me sitting in this chair. Um, and the the sad part is, is that that theater was packed. Mm. The theater was packed, and like people were having a good time with the movie. And good for them. If you're enjoying the movie, by all means, have a good time with it. But then I go to like, and then I go to like the Book of Clarence, and it's like half empty. 
And it's like such a better movie out there and people don't give a shit. They just want mindless entertainment. And I guess that's how it be sometimes, but it just be like I, that I cannot... sometimes. <sighs> should have should have saw that coming. <laughs> so bad. Um yeah, not a fan of this movie whatsoever. It's it was a waste of my time. Like there's not many movies where I'm like that was a waste of my time. This 100% a waste of my time. And directed by David Ayer, who keeps claiming that he has the best DC movie out there with his with his version the error cut of the Suicide Squad, the first of the Suicide Squad movie. I think he needs to sit down and shut up because if you're giving me this movie, I do not want to see your cut of Suicide Squad. Yeah. I no, no, thank you, sir. But anyway, we move on before I get more yes, mad. I feel um, <laughs> that I could, I told you it was progressively going to get worse as I went down this list. But anyway, that is all we've been watching. So now. Let's re- let's talk about a better movie by all means, uh, and that is American Fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson and uh, starring Jeffrey Wright, who also received an Oscar nom for his performance, as well as Sterling K. Brown. Uh, Sir Ernesto, your thoughts on the um, film? I absolutely loved it. So this is a this is based on the 2001 novel Erasure. This is a fantastic film. It hits a lot of notes about the culture. I mean, just. Right, I mean, right off the bat, the you know, kind of deconstructing what it is to me to be black, and the opening scene sets that brilliantly. You know, you have that student who's outraged with using the n word, and she's like, I don't think we should hear that. And he's like, If I can get over it, I think that you can too. And I think, (laughs) I think that that whole scene literally the way that it sets the stage for the movie was absolutely was beautiful. I think that it was really, Mm -hmm. really well done. Um, you get Monk's battle with him wanting to be a successful writer based on his merit, not just on the color of his skin. And you see that played out mm-hmm. in, a, in a couple of different ways. Um, even when he's, uh, I mean, the whole scene at the bookstore where he's like, this is not even an African-American studies book. Like it shouldn't even be in this section because I'm just a mm-hmm. writer who happens to be black. Um I also really enjoyed that the movie focused on family. You know, we get, there's the wedding, there's the death of his sister, there's the the declining health of his mother. There's also him coming to terms with his uh, father's suicide and kind of being like the whole movie being related, like everybody relating him to his dad saying that, well, you're just like dad or well, you, you were, mm-hmm. you know, Sterling K. Brown tells him about how much he, about how much dad loved him. And you see it through Sterling K. Brown and how, how his, he had a troubled relationship with his parents and you see that play. And I love the way that they peppered that in and it wasn't like, it just fit into the narrative they were able to fit all these different things into the narrative just so well i mean one of my favorite scenes is when Issa ray and monk are talking about the book fuck which he writes and he basically hmm. you know he tells her that her book is an inspiration from for his book and you know mm-hmm. she kind of has to she gives they kind of have a back and forth and she brings up issues you know talk about well i'm just giving the market what it wants and that there is actually some truth to my book, but yet we're seeing similar success with his story. That's just like it's just obviously it's just fiction, obviously, and that it's not mm-hmm. it's not real. And you know, you know she. But then what's ironic is that she's reading a book about oh, what was it called? Oh, oh she's yes, she's reading White Negroes while she was yes. in there, and it's like she's like I'm giving the market what it wants, and then you know she's reading that book and like really calling it out that some people just want to read to enjoy that it doesn't always have to be this this like um so well thought out like i don't i don't know what the best way to i don't know what the best way to to word it is but it it just not maybe like over like educated like you know kind of like how he was coming kind of how he was coming coming across my also something i also really really loved i think the lake house scene and the wedding was a scene that started out funny, but then turned out to be the one of the most beautiful scenes in the movie where they're walk, they're coming to the lake house to have the wedding and start in a uh, monk walks in and he sees these two men in their underwear cooking breakfast. And mm. he sees Sterling K Brown, like drugs out naked with all his friends there and monks telling him to get out. And then um, I want to, I want to get her character name. Let's see. 
she uh, she played like the uh, I guess the caretaker. Yeah. Uh, but what was let's see American fiction. Her name is. It is where is it? Here, right here. Uh, she she plays like Lorraine, um, played by Myra Lucretia Taylor. She um she walks in and he's like, you know, I'm so sorry. I'll leave. This is so embarrassing. And she's like, your family. Like it doesn't it doesn't matter. You and your friends are welcome to stay. Today is a day of love, and I love you. And I wouldn't want you anywhere mm-hmm. else. And I just think, like. What a something that turned out to be so humorous, humorous subverts itself and becomes like just like it really hits the nail. For me, that scene really hits the nail on the head about like what it is to be family, like just accepting somebody, a true meaning of just accepting body, accepting somebody for all their faults, for everything that they are and everything that they are. And I think that 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 like really ties in what's what's important, like kind of like, hey, what this is what's important. Yeah, and e- and even going off that scene, you can see that like there was a scene prior to that where you know the the mother was getting Alzheimer's, um, and like they're slow dancing and they were in the in the I, I guess it's not really retirement home, but it's like like a like they also check on your house, but I, I guess like you can call home. it a retirement home, but like yeah, like a nursing home, and they're slow dancing, and I said I'm so, and she even said without really realizing what she's saying was like I'm. I'm so happy you weren't, you didn't turn out gay or something along those lines. And it really oh, upset him said, and he walked out. I knew you weren't a queer or something. It was something like that. That's right. And then he just gets and, out and walks and so, out. And he gets out, right, exactly. And he gets out and he walks out. And so like, you can see that based with Lorraine's approach where like, he's literally has these, these strangers over half naked doing drugs on the table. And it was like, today's a day of love. And you think that the scene would just go, everyone's upset and just get the hell out. But you can see like the 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 nature versus nurture aspect of it of like this is the person who is his mother that kind of unknowingly regrets or his like his decision of how he wants to live and then you have this other character who's also been in his life the entire time not his mother and then kind of give a different approach to it and you can see he responded well to to the caring aspect of it rather than being neglected for it and so like you can see that that's really all he needed yep. Um, to really love. kind of be connected with the family exactly um, um i i really i also really enjoyed this film i thought jeffrey wright was obviously the star of this movie and more importantly its script it had a lot to say about you know basically what you said kind of like the you have a black writer who does not want to be known for writing black material and and but yet here we are and just because he's a black writer he's put in the wrong section of the book like basically this is like i'm not sure exactly what the genre of his book was maybe it was a sci-fi i don't remember they never, they, i don't they um, never really they never really go into exactly what it was but it wasn't like pathology or fuck <laughs> right yes and i think that is like the scenes when he was starting to write this fake book and basically is like it was almost like a like i hate everything about what I'm writing here, but I'm just going to put it all on the paper and see what happens. And as a joke, he's like, sell this to somebody like this is such a piece of shit. Sell this to somebody. And then you can see like, literally, I think there was a, a line that I wrote down where he was like, yeah, the dumber I get, <laughs> the richer I become. And I, to me, I think that's a great line of like what he's trying to, like he wants to be known for something better than just writing trash. But the audience are responding more to the trash than this fizzle, whatever his book was prior to this, which is probably more mature. And like y- you can see him dealing with that. And I found that very interesting to watch. Absolutely. I mean, and that was and that's to me, that's my main my main takeaway from this film is that, you know, we are more than our race and that these stories mm-hmm. are important so that we can explore other sides of ourselves. You see that reflected in Monk's character with him not opening up. To Coraline and uh, Sterling K. Brown when he calls him out, you know that scene where um, they're sitting on the porch and you look over at Coraline's mm-hmm. house and all the lights are off and he just—it's almost like, oh, I know my brother. That's the you fucked up look, and he's looking at yeah. him. He's like, "Did you do this? Oh, you did that, and then you led with this, and then you did that, and that's—and then you ended up pushing her, pushing 
you pushing her away like you you push her, her away with all your normal tactics and then it ends with him telling monk that you should let people love all of you like let mm-hmm. like learn to let us in let us love all the good and all the bad and i think that was another scene where it just really really hits home really really hits home and we see that represented at the end where they move to la with his brother where he seemingly leaves his other job behind in order to sell his screenplay with i think who's that was that adrian brody what's what's that what's that uh, actor's name y- y- yes y- yes but but no no that's not that, i think that that's not his name what is his name uh, adam adam brody. Adam, close. adam brody adam brody <laughs> close he he was actually he was in shazam actually. yes he was um yeah, he played the one of the one of the heroes. Um, but yeah, the what I found interesting about the particularly the ending of them. Well, actually, before I get to the ending, I, another scene that I really liked was the red and blue alcohol uh, analogy, where he was like, "See, here's just three different brands." Oh yeah. Uh, no, sorry, the same brand, different levels of alcohol that you're saying that like, this is the cheap stuff. Like it's all the same, but this one is the cheap stuff. The red. And the blue. The blue is expensive. That's when we all want to drink, but we can't afford that. So they give us the red. And the red is just good enough to buy. But every now and then, you know, you get the blue one. And either way, for them, the money is the same. The, like You still get the blue for the for the for basically the ex- expensive rich people. And you also get the red for the people who just want a cheap beer to drink or, or whatever it was, wine or whatever it was. And I think that was a great analogy of like as far as like a creative person. And we see that with many different directors out there. Sometimes you have a masterpiece and sometimes you just make a movie. They just want to entertain people. But you also have other creators who are pretty keen on making a specific movie, whether people watch it or not. I'm looking at you, Martin Scorsese. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Not Martin, not Martin Scorsese. I, I, I apologize. Ridley Scott mm. is very famous for recently making all of these movies that nobody's watching. And he's saying that cinema's dead because people aren't watching his movies and maybe also similar to Martin Corsese, but lately with the killers of flower moon, he's got a little bit of resurgence, but regardless, it's like you, you're making one specific movie that it's not making a profit, but you're saying this is, this is a great movie and we're not doubting that, but the core audience at the moment wants to see, you know, superheroes and Barbie, you know what I mean? It's like, that's where the masses are driving right now. And you can't control that. But that's so the thing. What do you do as an artist? But that's the thing. You use those other movies and the success showing that, hey, I can appeal to the market. You like my movie. We're here. Let me show you some of the other stuff that I've done mm-hmm. so that maybe we can – like I can do more than just this superhero thing. Like I can give you the same enjoyable story through this uh, – by telling you this other story and not something that, that may be considered just surface level. Right. And I can even use that analogy back to somebody who does blue and red is Steven Spielberg. Absolutely. Earlier in his career, you get films like Jaws, E.T., Jurassic Park, all that, all those films. But then later in his career, you get like The Post and Lincoln and uh, Schindler's List. Schindler's List is yeah. like uh, The Fablemans, all deep dramas and like depicting other parts of like the like these biopics. And like those are the movies he wants to make now. But the red those those are still great movies in its own right but it's just a different entertainment level that you're getting out of the other ones and so like thing. it's a different thing and i feel like he couldn't get past he was he was his own worst enemy like he couldn't just enjoy the fact that people were actually reading something that he wrote he was more focused on the quality of it because he knew it was bad but people were enjoying it and he couldn't get himself he couldn't get in his own get out of his own way and i felt that was really interesting as a character as an as an artist of what he's dealing with um, especially he, he presents himself in a certain way that he couldn't even use his real name to, pre- to present the book. But also that's part of the facade where like people are more into it because people thought it was real. Um, Absolutely. There, was, there was also another, there was also another element where I go back to the ending. I love the ending of it because I feel like we never really got an ending to this movie, which I feel like was the point of the movie. Yeah, that's actually in that's actually in my notes. Like I loved, I actually really um, enjoyed the open ended ending because God, where did I where did where did I put it? Um, sorry, I wrote a lot of shit down. Sorry, <laughs> um, kind of the ambiguous ending, like 
I think it's the reason why it was ambiguous because, you know, you he wants to you know he he wants to write his own he wants to write his own ending like it's not it's not cookie cutter what you think it's going to be he's like you know well the real core line like even i love the whole setup of even going through the different endings of like what could have happened or what should we what should we yeah. put, what should we put in the film um i i feel like i feel like we got three different endings for the movie and i think it worked for every story that they were trying to tell within this movie that we were watching. Correct. You know, it. I love that the ending, like, it exposes, like, the movie exposes all the problem, but it vaguely offers solutions, almost like leaving it up to us to make our own ending. You know, mm-hmm. and we and they talk about that, and I and I think the re that's the whole reason why we have that whole bit at the end is to really hit on the ambiguous ending because you don't know if he becomes successful. You don't even know what the backlash is of him. Of him being revealed as Stag Arley. But do we know he even revealed himself? We don't know. We don't even know that. We don't even know that. We don't know. Because I think it doesn't matter. I think at the end of it, like, that's not, it doesn't matter if we don't, if we find out. Like, that's not the point of the movie. It, what I also really appreciate with the ending, because I always felt like we were watching two different movies. We were watching a struggling artist trying to get his, his voice out there, but we were also giving a love story in there as well. Yeah, and I feel like, well, here's an, here's a an happy ending where he gets the girl at the end, or here's this somewhat happy-ish ending when he reveals himself that he is the true author of this. Or we can go down the movie route, the movie that he's now writing with the director of like, how do you want to end that the movie version of the movie? And to me, I thought it was great because like he and he dies, like you can tell that he just gave in to like basic movie stereotypes and like, and then they, uh, yep, they they just killed him. He's like, I love that ending. And then they kind of ran with it. Yeah. And he's like, and he's like, whatever. Right. It's what fine. fine. <laughs> and and I to me, like, you can see him kind of giving in because he need he was he needed the money and all that stuff. But like that's I feel like that's just the process. Eventually you're just gonna have to let go of what you want in order to gain something else. But some people fight for that respect as an artist, but also he never revealed himself to our knowledge. So like he can kind of live on those both worlds for a minute. I, I I think obviously the strongest part about this movie, aside from Jeffrey Wright's performance, is the writing. Yeah. It's yeah, it's all all there. Like the Oscar nom for for it hey, was it adapted or original either adapted. either or no it was adapted adapted. Uh, very much earned after watching this. Like this story is. It, it has a strong message about what it's trying to say for black creators. And even, even Issa Rae's performance in here and the, you see what he was inspired to do. And she was taking this as art. Mm. Like I was doing research and all that, but it's, it's kind of crazy that when she's doing an excerpt of the reading of her book, you're like, everyone's touting her for reading this great book. And then the dialogue in there is just straight up, like, what would you basically hear in, in the hood, quote unquote? Um, and so then he gives out a version like, is this what people want? Because basically it's a ripoff. And I think she even said something. And I think it was further going down of even how maybe um, uh, publishers even treat black artists and authors of like they wanted to stream like this into a movie. And he's like, you know what? I hate the title. I just want to call it fuck. And the fact that they're like, they're never going to go for this. And they went for it. Just like he's like, ah. All right. Yeah, all those scenes of them doing that like was so great. Like, yes, the people on the Hamptons like this is they're going to love reading this during the summer. She goes, "Yes, I will. They will." It's like, "I love <laughs> yeah. fuck. It's just so raw, so real." And he goes, "So black." He goes, "You said it. I'm glad that you did it, not me." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh there's also the part where um like he was a- appointed the judge He's like, hey, we're getting some uh, some backlash here with the company, so um, so we need we're we're higher on uh, to be a judge here. And he's like, and he basically told him, he's like, so you basically hire me because I'm black. He's like, yes, and you get paid for. It. He's like, all right, okay. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah, and like I feel like that's like that is like to me those scenes are just. I feel like that's that's just how it is. Yeah, but it like, really it it hits is, the head on a lot of many a lot of things that happen in our culture. Like all these little things, mm-hmm. they stack up to create the narrative. Like in our culture, stacked up to create 
this narrative and make it relevant. And what's interesting is that this book came out in what, 2001? Erasure, I think I saw. Really? Yeah. Erasure. When did Erasure come out? Wow. I didn't think it was that early. But the fact that, you know, he was able to adapt this and kind of write in his own way. I'm not sure how much he... 2001? 2001 by Percival Everett. And how how interesting is that back then he wrote about something that is so relevant in 2023, 2024? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I need to say, like, this this movie is, like... It had me entertained from start to finish, even, like, right from the beginning of, like, you know, using the N-word. He's like, if I can get over it, you can. It's like, he has a point. And then he gets in trouble for it. Uh, for being like abrasive and like not listening to your students and all this stuff. He's like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Um, I will say uh, I was quite surprised with how little we got of uh, Tracy Ellis Ross. Um, I expected her basically from the promotion and even the poster. I expected to see her a lot more in this movie. The fact that she died early in the film kind of surprised me, but also she was kind of the driving force on some of the other problems that were presented throughout the film. But I think her death is what kickstarted his, that's what started his journey. Like he was just coming yes. home to come home and then the death and then of his sister. And then, I mean, she was the one who was the caretaker so that he, mm -hmm. he inadvertently became her to take care of his mom. So like he was thrust yeah. onto all, to all these other issues while she her appearance was short lived, it was definitely like one of the most one of the more important characters of the film. Yeah, I I do agree with that because that definitely pushed forward our main character, and then we got to see a little bit more of Sterling K. Brown and and uh, what he was what he offered to the table. So, um, yeah. So with all that, Ernesto, your final thoughts? Uh, my final thoughts is that this movie was incredible. This absolute this movie was amazing. You can I can see the Oscar nomination for Jeffrey Wright, Sterling K. Brown, and for adapted screenplay. It is well deserved, um, and mm -hmm. obviously, I'm, excuse me, in best picture. Um, it it there's a lot to love about this film. Like I said, this year's yeah. Oscars is stacked, and this movie is well deserved to be up there. Um, I would easily I could this, the the thing about this one is that it's so good and it has a high rewatchability. I can easily go back yeah. and rewatch this film very easily. I feel like if, if I was going to knock it for anything, as I just feel like some of the, some of the romantic moments kind of brings them the, slows the movie down a little bit. Yeah. Of like some of the messages it was trying to say, because he was also trying to build up his confidence of even going back out and dating people again. Yeah. We also see that with the, with the nurse as well, the caretaker. Um, and like he, she finds quick love with the police officer and then they get married and all that stuff. And so like, I feel like if anything, that kind of slowed the movie down a little bit from the message it was trying to get across, but it, that's, um, that's nitpicking. That's a small knockdown yeah. for the movie five, at this point. Five out of five for me. Oh, five out of five. Absolutely. Wow. hundred percent. You know, I, I can meet you there. I was going to say four and a half, nope. but I'm going full five. It, full five. All right. Then I, I can't, I can't knock a full five then because I, I'm, I was close. But, you know, we'll, we'll go for the full it five. It just has here. a lot. To, I think that the because it's so humorous and it be it's so smart with its humor and how well it's played yes. out, I think just it's witty. And it, but it's not in like a pompous way. It's like very like very it's witty, but also digestible. Oh, that, that, I, that that's a good way of putting it, because, yeah, it is like anyone who has, has a brain can understand what we're doing here. Like it's it's not one of these like witty movies where like the audience needs to like to like think about too much. It's like it's the, your point. It's like it's witty and it's digestible and it's like it's a clear message we're getting across here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, Jeffrey Wright really nailed it. I think this was the first time I, I actually got to see him kind of take over in a leading role. I mean, mainly the big thing was like like either supporting roles or just his work on Westworld. So the fact that he takes center charge in this, like. I I'm, I'm happy to see him now taking on lead roles and, you know, maybe we can see more from Jeffrey Wright and I love Jeffrey Wright. Uh, in future. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's, he's great. He's, he's another one that, I mean, he's the watcher. I mean, anything he he's, did, he's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, and, and so far he's, you know, proven to be like, he, he deserves to be now a leading man at this point. Absolutely. Like he definitely earned that right. And Sterling K Brown is, is next up on that list. Like he got the supporting actor nom. I feel like given another few years, we'll see him leading a film after doing a full stunt on, um, what was the show called? This is us. Uh, this he is was us, the best right. thing about this is us. I mean, he was absolutely fantastic. 
He's so and good. he also he had a brief role in Black Panther as well. Yes. So like he he's definitely I wouldn't call him saying up and coming because I think he's already made a name for himself. But given a few more a few more years, he might be starring in a movie and we can be seeing him, you know, best actor I, for a lead performance. I definitely look for, I look forward to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, we got right. He I forgot he was also in uh Honk for Jesus like Honk for Jesus Honk Save for Your Soul. Jesus Save, Save Which Your he Soul. Was yeah. in. That was another great comic comedic film. Uh, that was reviewed that like uh, was that, 2022. Was that last year? The year before last? We did review it. I don't the know. year before. Yeah. Yeah. It was the year before. Yeah. He was great in that movie too. It's been one of the best things about yeah. it. Um, but yeah, again, American fiction, uh, a great, great story. Uh, definitely worth all of the nominations it was receiving. And I will meet Ernesto there with a five out of five stars on that. Uh, well, uh, like, again, I can go back and rewatch that movie. The script is definitely the highlight. I would 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 love to see it get it, um, but that is a conversation for another day. And when we go into our predictions episode, but that is our spoiler review of American Fiction, and that is all the show we have for you guys this week. Ernesto, tell our lovely listeners and remind them what we're reviewing for next week. Next week, we are going to be rounding out and finishing of watching all the Best Picture nominations. We are going to we are we are doing a double foreign film this month. We are going to be reviewing uh, the Zone of Interest. So that comes out this this weekend. We're recording on the 24th, so it is being released this weekend. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. All I'm saying for all these nominations, it better be a banger of a film. Yeah, because it's under a stacked stacked list here yeah. of like, I mean, I don't think we really overly are negative about any one of these movies that are nominated for Best Picture. I think for one of the rare times where I'm like, okay, I can see where the Oscar is coming from for almost all the nominations here, yeah. um, which we'll dive into more uh, again in our predictions episode. But uh, I will see now that I, I'm very interested to see the zone of interest because it was a surprise in many of the nominations. So we'll be the judge to see if it deserves all of those nominations. I believe five it received um, on our next episode. If you want more from us, you can always follow social us. media channels on Instagram and threads at box office underscore bingers, our Facebook, YouTube, and threads page at box office bingers, and our le- X and letterbox page at box office binger without the S. You can watch us on YouTube. Uh, you can see our beautiful faces here and all these wonderful graphics that we put up here at YouTube. You can always listen to us as well, like we usually do, and all the fun stuff we typically have on our social media channels as well. It's all there, letterbox. You can see all our movie reviews. It's all there on our social media channels. Be sure to follow every one of those. Um, um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for listening to us just talk about movies and watching us just talk about movies. Really do appreciate it. Come back next week for more movie fun. You're not going to regret it as we continue down the road to the Oscars. And for that, I've been your host, Matt Diaz. Ben Ernesto Santos. See ya.